bananas. Delicious, yellow, sexy bananas waiting to be ravished or eaten normally by normal people who like normal bananas in a normal way. Uh, Did you know that Americans eat more bananas per year than apples and oranges combined? In other parts of the world, bananas more than rice, more than potatoes, are what keep hundreds of millions of people alive. Bananas are great. As a protein smoothie lover, I have a banana almost every day and have for years. I like to chop them up, put them in cereal or an acai bowl. I love banana bread, banana cream pie, banana slices on some Nutella, on a crepe. Delicious. Uh, For a while as a kid, my favorite dessert was a banana split. And then there's banana pudding. I could go on and on. Bananas are great. Such an easy and tasty snack on the go. Bananas also helped shape the modernization of Central America in some really dark ways for many, many years. At the end of the 19th century, a few rugged and ruthless banana barons built a market for a product most Americans had never heard of. The fruit proved to be a commercial miracle. Within 20 years, bananas had surpassed apples to become America's best seller, despite the fact that the banana is a tropical product that rots easily and often needs to be shipped thousands of miles to make it to most of its markets. Those first banana companies, direct ancestors of Chiquita, they invented new ways of produce harvesting and shipping to bring bananas out of the dense jungles of Central America all the way to local U.S. markets without spoiling through the fruit's long distribution chain. To do that, they cleared rainforests, laid railroad tracks, built entire company towns. They invented radio networks to allow communication between plantations and cargo vessels approaching ports. They created some of the first vessels with built-in refrigeration. They spawned the modern fruit industry as we know it today. They built a vast and very profitable commercial empire. And so much of that is admirable, especially at first glance. But along the way, holy shit, did they engage in some ruthless and disgusting business tactics. Under the guise of, quote, civilizing Central America, they brutally subjugated local workforces in collaboration with local governments that they essentially came to own. When local workers refused to work long hours and squalid and in dangerous conditions for almost no money, sometimes literally not any money, just a tiny bit of company store credit with no hope for advancement, they crushed strikes without mercy. They also intentionally pitted their Hispanic workers against black West Indian workers to keep their laborers mad at each other instead of taking out their anger on their actual oppressors. And every once in a while, when the workers did manage to figure out who the real enemy was and they tried to stage a substantial strike, these banana barons literally sent in the troops. And that is what happened in Colombia in 1928. That's what led to the now infamous Banana Massacre in which an unknown number of people were rounded up and killed in the town of Cienega. The workers had some demands, very reasonable demands. They wanted compensation for work accidents, hygienic dormitories, six-day, 60-hour work weeks instead of seven-day, 70-hour weeks. They wanted to be paid in actual money instead of coupons to the United Fruit Company stores. And United Fruit did not want to give any of this to them. They wanted them to accept exploitation. And when they didn't, United Fruit decided, along with the Colombian government, that there would be blood. A dark and super strange chapter in the history of the American produce industry right now in another How the hell did I never hear about this before? Edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, Suckmaster. Lonely Hearts Club, Vice President. Guy who wears shoes so often. He's probably destined for a nervous breakdown. And you are listening to Time Suck. Praise be to the four horsemen of the suck apocalypse. Nimrod, Lucifina, Bojangles, and Triple M. May they someday bring about the best doomsday ever. Uh, recording this after some shows in Bloomington at the Comedy Attic. Man, what a cool college town. Such fun shows. Uh, I had a blast working on so much new stuff. Probably got a little crazy uh, Friday Night Late Show. Uh, <laughs> but that's what happens when you're working on new stuff. Sometimes you, you go too far in certain directions. Uh, By the time you hear this, I will have already worked at uh, Comedy on State in Madison as well. And if it goes anything like Phoenix and Bloomington, I'm going to be feeling great about a new rough draft of an hour of new material I'll be taking to clubs this fall. Right now, the only tickets on sale for the summer, uh, one weekend in Spokane in August, August 4th and 5th. And that's it. DanCummins.tv for tickets. Uh, Last reminder for our charity, I still don't have the amount, but I know we'll be donating around $14,500 to the DNA Doe Project a nonprofit with a simple, simple humanitarian mission to identify John and Jane Doe's using investigative genetic genealogy uh, to get some healing for those who have suffered such a 
a significant loss. Uh, to learn more, please visit dnadoeproject.org. And another 1,500-ish will be headed to the scholarship fund. The amounts will be updated on the Time Suck app, which will be reskinned and rebranded as the Bad Magic Productions app sometime later this year. And you can see on the app that so far we've raised over $600,000 for a variety of amazing charities. So thank you so much to everyone on Patreon who has helped us do that. And now one more quick announcement. Howdy, partners and ponies. Tom Anderson here from your favorite one-stop kink shop, Captain Whiskerhorn's Pony Play Emporium Tax Shop and Salary, the Quad State Area's number one destination for kink toys, whips, chains, inflatable plugs, silicon sounders, cock rings, click clams, butt bulbs, penis pumps, pussy pumps, edible condoms, and more. We are now proudly the world's exclusive carrier of Bear Evil Incorporated BDSM equipment and accessories. We're excited to announce our new expansion to our fifth location in the Quad State area, which means we're looking for adventurous ponies who are brave enough to saddle up for some serious kink. Actual saddle knowledge, not required, but definitely a bonus. Sound fun? Visit BadMagicMerch.com and pick up your new Captain Whiskerhorns employee tee and clip-clop on down to an orientation today. Choose between our new standard employee tee or our reissued classic tee in new colorways featuring me, Tom Anderson, in my true pony form. We look forward to seeing all your eager mares and stallions walking into our new shop real soon. hi Sasparilla! Away! Uh, so, so glad the Art Warlock, our merch wizard, brought Tom back. So I just had an excuse to uh, say all that ridiculous shit again. <laughs> And now on to a topic that our Patreon subscribing space has voted in for me to suck and share today, the 1928 Banana Massacre. Very different than the 1993 Banana Fornication, an incident that occurred in a small grocery store in Riggins, Idaho, where a teenage boy allegedly tested the premise that a banana peel was one of the vaginas of the fruit world in the employee bathroom. After spending time working closely with a large-breasted fellow employee named Rhonda in charge of produce who bent over a lot of the time, whom he had become quite attracted to. That teenage boy may have been me. I might have a stand-up bit about it out there called Chiquita Charlie. But today, not that kind of banana tail. Um, bananas bring up a lot of different uh, a lot of different associations, right? They're a staple in many of our day-to-day lives. Something quick to grab for breakfast on your way to work or school or healthy snack. Bananas are among the most important foods on the planet. Hailing from a family of plants called Musa, native to Southeast Asia, that grow in many of the warmer areas of the world. Bananas are a healthy source of fiber, potassium, vitamin B, vitamin C, and various antioxidants and phytonutrients. Bananas are great pre-workout snacks. They're loaded with potassium that aids in maintaining nerve and muscle function during strenuous activity. That high potassium content also means that they promote heart health, fight the world's most leading cause of premature death, which is heart disease. Bananas have other benefits too. The inside of a banana peel can help relieve itching and inflammation, such as from bug bites or poison ivy. And if ripe enough, the inside of a banana peel can kind of act as a lubricant for uh, Halo Safina. Uh, based on the bananas we see in pretty much all of our grocery stores, it's easy to ascertain that there is big business in bananas. Even a little gas station that doesn't have a produce section will still often have bananas. Uh, so many of the coffee shops I've been in over the years, if they have one fruit option, it's almost always a banana. The biggest producers of bananas are not the countries I expected. Care to take a guess regarding the top two in the world? I would not have gotten these countries in 10 guesses, maybe not in 20. India, number one producer of bananas, followed by China. India produces about 29 million metric tons on average per year, almost 64 billion pounds of bananas, while China produces about 11 million metric tons. The Philippines, Ecuador, and Brazil are also very large producers. I want to guess how many varieties of bananas there are. I was way off with this one. There are thought to be more than 1,000 varieties of bananas, subdivided into 50 main groups grown in over 150 countries. The Cavendish is by far the most commercialized variety. They're sweeter, generally eaten raw, accounting for about 47% of global production and over 90% of production here in the, in the U.S. About 50 billion metric tons of Cavendish bananas produced globally each year. And actually 99% of the bananas exported to developed nations across the world belong to this group. All of this is interesting, at least to me, but also pretty fucking benign, right? Bananas tend to make us think of harmless things like breakfast, snacks, uh, maybe mushed up food for babies. Nothing too intense. What bananas probably don't bring to mind, but sometimes should, is ruthless corporate greed. 
a complicated and somewhat violent legacy of American corporate empires and the way they shaped Central America beginning in the 1800s. And that is the main story today. Going to try and cover a lot of ground this episode. Though the Banana Massacre was one incident that took place on December 6, 1928, after a two-month-long strike, the story of what led to the Banana Massacre is much longer, deeper, more complicated, and I think a lot more interesting. It's a story of how entrepreneurs from the U.S. transformed South America in the 19th and early 20th centuries, turning undeveloped nations, newly independent from Spain, mostly agricultural farming countries into industrial hubs that produce millions of tons of produce and other raw materials each year. It's a story of how these companies began to not just work in these countries, but take them over, operating much more like governments than foreign corporations. They ran the railroads, postal service, customs, and more. In the beginning, many Central American governments were happy to have the help in advancing their infrastructure, industry, and overall economic growth. But then the U.S. government, working with U.S. corporations, exercised more and more pressure on local regimes, often putting people into power who were on board with foreign investment that eventually would come to be seen for what they were, exploiters rather than investors. Eventually, local governments took back some autonomy, but before they did, they would do things like deploy their own military against their own people to protect foreign U.S. business ventures. And that's what happened in the, uh, in the Banana Massacre. And it wasn't new in 1928. Similar shit had been going on for years. Today, we'll cover U.S. involvement, both on the part of the government and private individuals in shaping Central America. We'll look at nations where United Fruit and other companies had a huge influence, not only in Colombia, but also in Costa Rica, Cuba, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Of course, the full history of U.S. involvement in any one of these nations would take an entire podcast series. We're only dedicating part of an episode to that today. Before we get into a timeline where we'll focus on United Fruit and its expansion and the conflicts it faced in these various nations, as well as how it shaped the lives of its workers, both white and non-white, we'll first look at what the Banana Massacre would come to embody to Colombians and Central Americans at large. The result of long-term and large-scale imperialism. So let's fucking go! Uh, the Banana Massacre might have been lost to history, were it not for the book 100 Years of Solitude by Colombian author uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the winner of the 1982 Nobel Peace Prize, or Nobel Prize, not Peace Prize, Nobel Prize in Literature. My brain automatically wants to put peace after Nobel. Uh, Marquez was born in Aracataca, Colombia. <laughs> that's, how, that's how the people were saying it on YouTube. Aracataca, Colombia. In 1927, making him an infant when the Banana Massacre took place, but the Banana Massacre and United Fruit in general shaped his home country and surrounding areas profoundly. He was also led to reflect on the Banana Massacre through a more personal connection. His grandpa, Colonel Nicolas Ricardo Marquez Mejia, well known for his refusal to remain silent about the Banana Massacre. Indeed, in the immediate aftermath of the Banana Massacre, Colombia's Liberal Party, to whom the colonel belonged, stepped up its vocal criticism of United Fruit and other companies that had dominated Central American economies for decades. By contrast, conservative leaders and newspapers maintained that the army's actions had been warranted. They had to be done. They had the support of the U.S. government on their side who supported United Fruit's actions, whatever they happened to be, even violence against local populations. It was authors like Marquez who tried to correct the, the official record, not only of the Banana Massacre, but of United Fruit in general, who always claimed that its domination of Central America was for the good of the local people, that it had came to civilize and develop some backwards nations. 100 Years of Solitude plays out against the backdrop of bananas, but the climax deals directly with the massacre, occurring during a plantation strike when martial law is declared. The workers gather in their town square amidst ominous signs. Around 12 o'clock, Marquez writes, more than 3,000 people, workers, women, and children had spilled out onto the open space in front of the station and were pressing into the neighboring streets, which the army had closed off with rows of machine guns. The crowd remains in the square even after their order to disperse. A second warning is met with defiance, and eventually time runs out. Fourteen machine guns answered at once, but it all seemed like a farce. It was as if the machine guns had been loaded with caps because their panting rattle could be heard and their incandescent spitting could be seen, but not the slightest reaction was perceived, not a cry, not even a sigh among the compact crowd that seemed petrified by an instantaneous vulnerability. Suddenly, on one side of the station, a cry of death tore open the enchantment. Ah, mother! A seismic voice, a volcanic breath, the road of a cataclysm broke out in the center of the crowd. 
3,000 striking banana workers are killed. And then their bodies, one by one, are thrown into the ocean in an attempt to cover up what had just occurred. In the novel, Marquez uses this event to capture the profane fury of modern capitalism, so powerful it not only can dispossess land and command soldiers, but control the weather. After the killing, the company's U.S. administrator, Mr. Brown, summons up an interminable whirlwind that washes away not only Macondo, but any recollection, any recollection of the massacre. The storm propels the reader forward towards the novel's famous last line, where the last descendant of the Buendia family finds himself in a room reading a Romani prophecy. Everything he knew and loved would be wiped out by the wind and exiled from the memory of men because races condemned to 100 years of solitude did not have a second opportunity on earth. The book is a powerful parable of virtually unchecked imperialism, especially the distinct type of imperialism that United Fruit and other corporate empires were practicing in Central America beginning in the mid-1800s. This kind of imperialism and how it led to the banana massacre, right, is our focus today. We've previously previously discussed imperialism in our episode on the colonial devastation of Africa. In that episode, we learned about how in 1884, Otto van Bismarck, chancellor of the German Reich, decided that Europe needed to sit down and figure out how to carve up an entire continent specifically for European profit. That happened at the Berlin Conference. France, Germany, Great Britain, Portugal were the major players. One of the tasks of this conference was for each European country that claimed uh, possession over a part of Africa to bring, quote, civilization in the form of Christianity as well as trade. Lots and lots of one-sided trade. The way European imperial powers carved up Africa to serve their own greed, ignoring which tribes lived where and who they historically fuck and hated, exploiting the population and taking almost all of the wealth out of Africa has left much of Africa pretty fucked up and war-torn to this day, a direct result of this. King Leopold II of Belgium promised just uh, that uh, promised that the Congo would be formally recognized as his personal possession. And the Congo was and is extraordinarily rich in natural resources, including ivory, palm oil, timber, and rubber. And Leopold would greatly increase his personal wealth at the expense of the African environment and the people of the Congo. And similar shit happened around the rest of the continent. Uh, what happened in Central America would take place a little differently. They would not be multiple countries slicing up the continent, uh, continent as they had at the Berlin Conference. They would not be drawn up a national border, uh, you know, for all these places. But, uh, but a lot of exploitation would go down. Beginning around 1840, the U.S. became increasingly involved in Central America and the Caribbean, reshaping it with the idea that the goal of any society should be to look, work, and be structured like the U.S., but like kind of like subjugated also by the U.S., the 1995 book, The Banana Men, American Mercenaries and Entrepreneurs in Central America, 1880 to 1930, written by Lester D. Langley and Thomas Schoonover, uh, will, will be one of our main sources for this episode. And it would describe the U.S.'s unique form of imperialism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries like this. Tragedy often results when Americans adopt liberal development values and societies deemed important for the U.S. role in the world. The insistence that these societies assimilate U.S. values and institutions negates the fundamental liberal principle of self-determination and weakens domestic political institutions, particularly where comprador elites who are often subservient to or co-opted by foreign concerns seem more determined to defend the interests of the foreigner than those of the nation. Anyone else uh, never heard the word uh, comprador before? It means a person within a country who acts as an agent for foreign organizations engaged in investment, trade, or economic or political exploitation. So essentially some motherfucker happy to sell out his fellow citizens' interests to some foreign organization. Continuing with this excerpt, the U.S. government warned, or excuse me, the U.S. government wanted Central America developed, but in accordance with U.S. economic and geopolitical interests. It also enunciated the goal of assisting Central American states in the modernization of liberal institutions and democratic practices. Materialism frequently triumphs over humanitarian and idealistic goals. Well, so while uh, U.S. government officials attempted to acquire territorial possessions in the the region, private citizens known as filibusters, filibusterers, weird word, also organized armed expeditions to various places in Mexico, Central America, and Cuba. After the territorial acquisitions of the 1840s in North America, the idea of additional territorial expansion remained very popular with many in the U.S. public, as did the idea of spreading a Republican government. Cuba, in particular, was seen as an attractive possibility for a new American state. I'm not going to lie. 
totally selfishly, I do kind of wish we had Cuba as a state, right? It would just be nice to have a second Hawaii of sorts, not far from the mainland. White sand, it's fucking beautiful. I haven't been, which is based on pictures. White sand beaches, nice, some nice mountains, lush jungles, warm weather year round. Ah, it looks amazing. And the food is, at least what we get here in America is fantastic. Anyway, filibustering and official U.S. diplomacy were equally unsuccessful in acquiring permanent and significant territorial gains in Central America and also tended to incite local antagonism against U.S. actions in the region. Although the Civil War ended the nation's dreams for large-scale territorial expansion, the nation emerged from Reconstruction with a dynamic economy that increasingly demanded overseas outlets for American exports and capital. That opened the path for businesses to start making commercial inroads into Central America to bring back to the U.S. raw materials like coffee, sugar, and fucking sexy-ass nanners. In the 1850s, a New York company constructed the Panama Railroad to further U.S. corporate interests in the region, the world's uh, first transcontinental railway. By the 1870s and 1880s, such ventures had become increasingly commonplace around the Caribbean. In Central America, additional U.S. entrepreneurs built key railroads, uh, railways excuse me, and laid banana plantations, while other U.S. merchants moved into Cuban sugar production. In the mid-1890s, a severe economic downturn in the U.S., the Panic of 1893, and local labor upheaval in America spurred many political and business leaders to embrace commercial and imperial expansion as their answer to domestic turmoil. Basically, it was a deal of, if we can't get American workers to accept next to fucking nothing, maybe we can get foreigners to do that. And if Americans don't want to pay our prices, well, maybe people in other markets will. Uh, These corporate empires were, by and large, very successful and expanded and expanded, becoming a critical factor in shaping life and work in many parts of Central America. And life was shaped according to the very racist ideologies of the day. Ideologies that believe local, non-white people were inherently backwards, provincial, mentally incapable of governing themselves, and they needed united fruit and other corporations to show them the right way. And of course they had these attitudes. These attitudes have been shaped for centuries in America. Uh, United fruit managers, other white Americans, carried a complex legacy of race and labor with them to Central America. And uh, it also already existed all around the Caribbean and further south before they even got there. Spain first imported African slaves to the Caribbean colonies in the early 16th century. By the 1530s, Portuguese entrepreneurs were using African slaves to develop a profitable sugar trade in Brazil. By the 1640s, the English sugar colony of Barbados had followed suit, turning to enslaved Africans as its main source of labor. And in the following decades, planters in mainland colonies such as Virginia and Carolina adapted the system to tobacco and rice cultivation. In the process of producing these tropical commodities, white superiors came to see black people as commodities in and of themselves, as in slavery, while also thinking they had the ability to withstand tropical diseases and the harsh conditions that plantation labor entailed. They thought that black people were somehow better and more fit for doing backbreaking manual labor and convinced themselves, selfishly I'm sure, that they thrived on little access to food beyond basic staples and basic housing accommodations. While white people were best suited to be, you know, supervisors, bosses, and they needed, of course, uh, better accommodations and luxuries. Uh, Fucking ridiculous. Oh, oh, don't be silly. Increased wages? (laughs) They don't even want that, really. They're not like us. They don't really care about money or wealth building or mattresses to sleep on or time off to relax with their families or medical treatment. No, No way, Jose. They actually enjoy working themselves to death in the fields and dying penniless. It's what they want. We're doing it for them, really. It's a great system for everyone. Uh, yeah, fucking absurd that they actually convince themselves of this uh, win-win. Just hooray for everyone. Uh, these preposterous illogical and guilt-reducing racial assumptions gained force in the early 19th century as cotton uh, grown on the expanding southwestern frontier topped the nation's exports and fed northern textile mills. And I think I fucked up there by now. Southeastern. Uh, well, I guess I guess what? No, it was a little southwestern going to Texas. Sorry. Struck me as weird now. Uh, In the process, whites across the nation embraced the dehumanized and emasculated vision of black people that slavery produced. Even people living in the North. Northerners flocked to stage shows such as the 1828 smash hit Jump Jim Crow, which featured a white performer in blackface impersonating a bumbling, idiotic slave. And such attitudes moved easily across frontiers and blue water borders. In 1856, for example, New Englander John M. Dow a skipper for the Pacific Mail and Steamship Company, tried to impress white women in Kingston, Jamaica by having local, quote, Negro boys perform tricks for fucking money. It's so cringy. In a letter to his future wife, he recalled, 
That which amused the ladies most was when I directed the little ebony-faced fellows to form themselves into a line against the wall of the yard, to look up, open their eyes and lips wide, and teeth compressed together, that we might see the line of contrast, which their white teeth and eyes made with their dark skins. It was a ludicrous sight. Sweet fucking Jesus! When he tossed the coins, he noted, All white had disappeared, leaving nothing but a confused jumble of little woolly heads knocking against and tumbling over each other. This motherfucker treated them uh, like they were dogs, because that is exactly how he honestly saw them. By the time of the Civil War, two and a half centuries of slavery had shaped popular views of blacks uh, and their proper quote-unquote place in American society. Northern as well as Southern whites associated blackness with menial work, entertainment, and social inferiority. These shared assumptions weakened the nation's commitment to Reconstruction, dampened Northern opposition to the violent reassertion of Southern white supremacy that became synonymous with Jim Crow. Essentially, while many Northerners disagreed about slavery, they tended to agree that black people were still inferior. Even the most so-called progressive people thought that black people still needed to be told what to do, supervised, and had little ability for self-determination or autonomy. This line of thought would extend to Central America, with United Fruit and other companies saying that they needed to govern these regions because they were the only ones who could guide these inferior dipshits towards industry and democracy in ways that they couldn't possibly do themselves. And sadly, they could have used their wealth and power to actually help a less developed, less industrially educated nation modernize and increase the basic standard of living for locals and still make a lot of money. They could have done that in a way that still, you know, uh, made them, you know, money without treating local people like subhuman pieces of shit. But they knew they could make even more money if they did things a different way. Uh, They used their capital to create things like railroads, mail services, customs and more taking on many of the roles that would have otherwise gone to these countries' governments. But they did not do that for the locals. They did it for themselves. And local governments, believing that the industry was needed at all costs, let them do this at the great expense of their workers who were disenfranchised, subjugated to uh, very little pay and poor conditions. Uh, Local governments allowed these companies to manipulate the working class citizens in ways that only benefited the corporations. This manipulation came in a lot of different forms. One that was very frequent was a tactic called labor segregation, which had been developed in northern industrial hubs in the U.S. Black workers in most shops and factories in the Northeast were, by the 1850s, frequently intentionally pitted against Irish immigrants by their New England textile barons to divide the workers, right? Get them to constantly underbid each other when it came to pay and working conditions, and through that process, hate each other instead of hating the factory owners that were setting this whole system up. Over the following decades, massive immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe enabled large industries such as steel to refine this strategy further. By 1907, economist John R. Commons uh, would claim that the only device and symptom of originality displayed by American employers in disciplining their labor force has been that of playing one race against the other. This system of labor control featured the manipulation of tensions amongst immigrants and native-born whites, to be sure, but also rested upon a shared commitment to racial hierarchy. Despite the cultural differences among them, all workers perceived as, quote, white, socially and economically benefited from non-white subordination, and most objected to the employment of black workers in any but the most menial positions. The hiring of African Americans also proved to be an effective means of weakening unions and breaking strikes. The factory owners continued with production, and again, anger was directed from one group of workers towards another instead of the people, you know, hiring the African Americans and setting up this tension. And that reminds me of misplaced anger in many places towards illegal immigrants in the U.S., right? And some, uh, if some illegal immigrant truly has taken your job because they'll accept a wage you can't live on, should you be mad at them or should you be mad at the person who hired them and is paying them a lesser wage? To me, it's pretty clear. The person who hired them is the problem. They're the one that allowed your job to be taken. If they would not have done that, then the illegal immigrant would have no job to take for a lesser wage and then there would be no problem. The United Fruit Company would employ tactics like the ones I've just laid out in Central and South America. When resistance from its black workers threatened United Fruit's authority, the company sought to build a divided workforce by recruiting local Central Americans. But these Central Americans wouldn't be all too happy with their working conditions either. As worker tensions mounted, the weight of exploitation became too much to bear and violence was on the horizon. Stage set! Let's now examine the growth of the United Fruit Company, how it dealt with its workers, and the Banana Massacre in today's Time Suck Timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck Timeline.
Let's start in 1821. That year, the states that composed the Central American Federation, known today as Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, all declared independence from Spain on September 15th. I don't know that I knew that they all did that at the same time before. Spain must have been pissed. For King Ferdinand VII, it's tough to hate the office. I have terrible news, your highness. Costa Rica has declared its independence. Seriously? Oh, shit, that sucks, bro. I fucking love Costa Rica. They have the best rice and beans. That really bums me out. I have more, I'm afraid, sire. El Salvador has also declared independence, your highness. On the same day? Shit! I'm gonna miss those pupusas and, of course, the money we got from taxing them two in one day. What the fuck? Uh, Still not done, your highness. Uh, Guatemala has also left. Oh, come on! I mean, at least we have Honduras and Nicaragua, right? Mm, Actually, your highness. No! Five? Does Spain even have Spain anymore? For now, your highness. A lot of talk about an impending civil war, though. Uh, These five states, along with the location of today's topic, Colombia, which included the nation of Panama until 1903, was a territory of Colombia, uh, become home to the United Fruit Company's corporate empire. At the time, the five nations who broke away from Spain only had about one and a quarter million inhabitants. In 1823, these states formed the United Provinces of Central America under General Manuel Jose Arce. Uh, The U.S. recognized the independence of the Federation of Central American States from Spain on August 4th, 1824, when President James Monroe received Antonio Jose Canas Arcanas as Envoy Extraordinary and Minister (laughs) Plenipotentiary. Oh my God, she she uri. Jesus Christ, plenipotentiary. There we go. That's a fucking weird ass title. What do you do? Why I am an envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary. I feel like you have to carry around a fucking bugle or trumpet, right, to, to play every time before you say that. Uh, what do I do? Bum ba dum ba ba. Envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary. Uh, that was the title given to the diplomatic head of a mission ranked below ambassador. Fucking weird. That ambassador is a higher rank than envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary. That's a fucking dumb title. We should go back in time, find who made up that title, and fucking execute them. Anyway, pretty immediately now, the U.S. would put it out there that no other countries were supposed to interfere in newly independent Latin America. Uh, I did this with something called the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, My daughter Monroe, uh, named after this doctrine, The Monroe Doctrine was a new policy articulated by President James Monroe to Congress on December 2nd, 1923. The doctrine warned European nations that the U.S. would not tolerate further colonization in Latin America or any other territories in the New World. If anyone was going to fuck with Central or South America, it was going to be the U.S. Said, uh, or he said, with the existing colonies or dependencies of any European power, we have not interfered and shall not interfere. But with the governments who have declared their independence and maintain it, and whose independence we have on great consideration and on just principles acknowledged, we could not view any interposition for the purpose of oppressing them or controlling in any other matter their destiny by any European power in any other light than as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition toward the United States. Right? In short, you fuck with them, you fuck with us. Uh, My daughter Monroe, not named after that doctrine, by, (laughs) by the way, I lied. Now, she was named after some ancestor who had the last name of Monroe. I, I like history, but not enough to name uh, one of my kids after some early 19th century U.S. foreign policy. On the surface, this new policy uh, seemed to give newly independent Central America some protection, but Monroe had another aim. Uh, the policy, not my daughter. The young U.S. needed to expand economically if it was going to survive as an independent country, meaning it needed new trading ties and influence in regions to the South. European mercantilism uh, posed the greatest obstacle to U.S. economic expansion. In particular, Americans feared that Spain and France might reassert colonialism over the Latin American peoples who had just overthrown European rule in another way through doing what they wanted to do with corporations. For their part, the British also had a strong interest in ensuring the demise of Spanish colonialism with all the trade restrictions mercantilism imposed. Earlier in 1823, British Foreign Minister George Canning suggested to Americans that the two nations issue a joint declaration to deter any other power from intervening in Central and South America. But Secretary of State John Quincy Adams struck that down. He was like, no thank you, you crown-loving, mushy pea eating limey fucks! Or something like that. I don't know how aggressive he was, but he didn't want it. It was American influence or bust in Central America. 
Meanwhile, over the following decades, the Central American Federation began to dissolve during 1838 through 1840 due to civil war. In forming and reforming these states, Central American leaders tried to assure their country's sovereignty. But soon these officials would learn about the power of the cash crop and the money that foreign investment would put directly into their pockets. Not the pockets of their people, not to the benefit of their nation, but in their personal pockets. What they may not have bargained for was how incorporation into the world economy soon placed severe limitations on their sovereignty and capacity for self-government. Meanwhile, the 1848 victory over Mexico in the Mexican-American War left thousands of young American men enthralled with conquest and convinced of their destiny to travel to lands unknown to stake their fortune. Manifest destiny! Away! I feel like I want to hit that button again. (laughs) Subjugation! Away! It also yielded uh, Pacific territories that lacked transportation links to the rest of the nation. A deficiency, a deficiency that became apparent when the discovery of gold in California brought a stampede of American prospectors. Although most made their way directly across the plains and deserts of the West, thousands more traveled by sea and land via Nicaragua and Panama. That migration in turn drew the attention of U.S. adventurers, entrepreneurs, and policymakers to Central America. They just, well, what's going on down here? Maybe we should stay here and see what, see what kind of money can be made. Uh, with the gold rush, U.S. merchant ships began arriving on the Pacific and Caribbean coasts. And the population boom in California provided a new market for regional exports, particularly coffee. American migrants carried with them domestic prejudices that often contributed to the abuse of local residents, sometimes took on an anti-Catholic bent in the mid-19th century. In June 1849, for example, a U.S. traveler refused to doff his hat uh, during a religious procession in Chinundiga, Chinundiga, Nicaragua, and then drew a pistol on the priest who tried to remove the hat from him. Other Americans viewed Central America as a new, relatively lawless outlet for sexual desires, forcing themselves on local women or marrying them under false pretenses. In 1853, for example, U.S. newspaper editor E. George Squier, and it's, I thought it was Squire. It might be Squire, but it's pronounced Squier, or it's spelled Squier, uh, reported that in Granada, a man named Walcott had married a very respectable girl of the country and afterward left her, having a wife or two in the States. Uh, Many of these visitors thought that the white Americans would soon rule these areas. In October 1851, Michigan native Albert Wells, now living in Granada, asserted that American residents, quote, look forward to the time when black blood will be forced to take the position that nature designed it should occupy. Yikes. Uh, Overall, Americans weren't really worried about infringing on locals' rights. All right, again, manifest destiny. Uh, Despite the prejudices and air or supremacy brought by American visitors, Central America opened to American industrialism in the 1850s. Uh, In February 1855, the Panama Railroad Company announced the official opening of the world's first transcontinental railway. Uh, Located within what would become the Panama Canal Zone a half century later, the line connected Cologne on the Caribbean to Panama City on the Pacific. At the time, it represented the largest American investment anywhere in the world outside the borders of the U.S. Simultaneously, American commercial magnate Cornelius the Commodore Vanderbilt what a fucking name. That guy sounds so punchable, right? Like if you met some, <laughs> if you met somebody or you're going to meet somebody at a party, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Cornelius the Commodore Vanderbilt. My reaction internally would be like, God, I want to fucking punch this piece of shit in the face. Like just based on the name. I don't think I'm going to like this guy. Uh, but Vanderbilt's accessory transit company obtained a contract to launch a river, lake, and land route through Nicaragua. Since there was a shortage of local Hispanic labor at the time, most of the laborers on these projects were British West Indians, Jamaicans, and other uh, Caribbeans. In the middle decades of the 19th century, some 300,000 West Indians traveled to Central America, providing critical labor to foreign enterprise. In addition to French and American canal projects, United Fruit would employ most of these workers. Jamaicans and other migrant workers now became an integral part of U.S. expansion into Central America. They saw Central America as a place where they would be able to pursue further emancipation that had started with the Jamaican Slave Rebellion of 1831. Their quest for autonomy and economic self-determination led them to accept jobs at United Fruit and similar companies where they hoped to save enough money to later buy some land back in their home islands. What they likely did not know was that the uh, labor force they would be joining at their new companies would be just as racially segregated as work was back home. And they would be on the bottom without much of an opportunity to make any money at all. And they could also be subject to violence. In May of 1854, local residents attacked Vanderbilt's property after one of the company's American captains shot a black boatman. Determined to protect a U.S. firm in a strategically vital region, U.S. President Franklin Pierce dispatched the U.S. warship 
uh, Cyan, which bombarded and virtually destroyed Greytown. To justify the destruction, Pierce cited the offenses committed by, quote, a heterogeneous assemblage gathered from various countries and composed for the most part of blacks and persons of mixed blood with mischievous and dangerous propensities. They didn't even fucking hide their dehumanizing views back then. We had to show them some force. You know how, you know how they are. Uh, they can't be reasoned with. The savages only understand brutality. Like they just, that's a fucking president. Just openly talking like that. Uh, now another thing increases American presence in Central America, particularly in Panama, the gold rush. Between 1848 and 1860, more than 200,000 Americans crossed what was then a narrow Colombian province, right, Panama. Initially, American travelers crossed by river and rail, uh, or river and trail, relying on Afro-Panamanian guides and boatmen. They drew upon familiar racial assumptions and chafed at being in a place where whiteness was not the norm. The combination of U.S. corporate power and the imperious behavior of U.S. migrants stirred anti-American sentiment among uh, Panamanians most famously during the April 1856 watermelon riot in Panama City. Although the incident began with the refusal of an American traveler to pay a local vendor for some watermelon he had sampled, it quickly escalated into mob violence that targeted company property as well as U.S. US migrants. After 16 Americans and two Panamanians were killed, the Pierce administration dispatched naval vessels. By September, with tensions continuing to mount, U.S. Marines briefly landed in Panama City to guard the rail depot. Although the American press denounced the riot as mindless savagery, many Panamanians considered it patriotic resistance to U.S. expansionism. Many Panamanians who already did not want to be part of Colombia also did not want Americans fucking around in their nation. But this resistance would soon fall to a sweeping tide of American immigrants. As the U.S. experienced a series of economic depressions through the 1870s, from 1873 to 1878, again from 1883 to 1885, and again from 1893 to 1898, more and more Americans look towards financial opportunities abroad. Thankfully for these people, many of the uh, Central American governments would see the U.S. and its investors as potential allies. This connection was especially evident in Costa Rica and Guatemala. By the 1850s and 60s, the coffee exports of both countries were growing quickly due in part, largely, actually, to new markets in California. In addition to reshaping regional land use and labor systems, this rising coffee sector brought to power ambitious leaders who were determined to promote economic development of their nations at basically any cost. In both Costa Rica and Guatemala, their visions of progress hinged upon the construction of Caribbean railroads that would carry coffee to Atlantic markets. To build these lines, they turned to U.S. contractors and U.S. mercenaries to subdue opposing political parties and resistance uh, of any form. One of these mercenaries they turned to was a fucking lunatic named William Walker. (laughs) This guy, he sounds like he was a lot. He was a doctor, lawyer, journalist, and mercenary, and dabbled in being a warlord. Uh, Locked in a losing struggle with the rival conservative party, Nicaraguan liberals contacted Walker, who, along with 55 men, boarded a leaky brig in San Francisco in May of 1855 and sailed for the Pacific port of uh, Rialjo. Uh, Rialjo, I think is how you say it. Contrary to the hopes of his local allies, however, Walker planned not to restore uh, liberal rule, but to just conquer Nicaragua and its neighbors for himself. After defeating the conservatives and setting up a puppet regime in Granada, he now called for American immigration, and he received an enthusiastic response. In two months alone, Vanderbilt's transit company carried 2,000 recruits to join Walker's crusade. U.S. President Franklin Pierce uh, promptly recognized Walker's regime, and the Democratic Party inserted a plank into its 1856 platform endorsing American ascendancy in the Gulf of Mexico. Fearing that Walker planned to conquer the entire region, Costa Rican troops invaded Nicaragua in the spring of 1856, and soon after, Vanderbilt turned against Walker. Hoping to rally support in the U.S., Walker played the race card. In addition to doling out land and mining concessions to white settlers, he also, this fucking maniac, reinstituted slavery in September of 1856, which had been abolished in Nicaragua 18 years earlier in 1838. Who is this motherfucker? He was like an American conquistador. Dude headed down south with 55 other guys, small band of fellow mercenaries, and just took shit over. And then started passing crazy laws and building a bigger army. And this guy had previously done the same shit in northern Mexico. He took over the state of Sonora and most of Baja, California for a little while. Then the Mexican army beat him out. Uh, Just a random guy. Just going around taking over other parts of the world. Not on behalf of the U.S. directly. Like initially just on behalf of himself. It's fucking wild. Imagine if that still happened today. Right, a story pops up on your news feed about some guy you used to go to high school with, and he's just taken over the Dominican Republic. 
Just like, holy shit. Baby, did you hear about Carl Damon? Yeah, Carl from high school. He fucking runs the Dominican Republic now. Seriously, apparently he got a bunch of guys together from his softball league. They formed some kind of militia and they just fucking took it over. Yeah, here's a pic of him sitting on a throne he made. He's a, he's a king now. He didn't even get good grades in school. Now he's a fucking king. You think he's still going to come to the reunion? Uh, regarding his reintroduction of slavery, Walker said that such policies aimed to make Nicaragua a home for Southern men. He added with the Negro slave as his companion, the white man would become fixed to the soil and they together would destroy the power of the mixed race, which is the bane of the country. Again, these fucking attitudes. These are just like things that are just being like uh, published in, you know, the press and people are just reading them going, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. In- instead of just like, what the fuck? Uh, the restoration of slavery increased opposition to Walker. Of course it did. How did he not see that coming? And by early 1857, Central American armies were besieging his regime. Defeated in battle, weakened by disease, the surviving Walker soldiers were rescued by a U.S. naval vessel. Walker, not done though. Of course not, because this is a fucking crazy person. Over the following months, he seeks help uh, reclaiming his empire by stoking sectional tensions in the U.S. In 1858, uh, sorry, 1857 and 1858, he undertook a big speaking tour to the South, proclaiming that his policies had been calculated to bind the Southern states to Nicaragua as if she were one of themselves. And in response, many Southerners were like, oh, fuck yeah. They took up, they took up his cause. In March of 1858, the newspaper, the New, or- the New Orleans Crescent, called for Southern conquest of Central America, not only because, quote, our own peculiar form of society is best suited for renovating the tropical regions of this continent, but to prevent abolition fanaticism from getting the first foothold in Nicaragua. Such efforts, it added, would provide a national method by which to heal the social and political disorder of Spanish America and to restore the choicest portions of the continent to the uses and purposes of civilization. In reality, Walker's wars devastated the region, with deaths from gunfire and disease numbering in the tens of thousands. Central American governments now saw that inviting Americans into their borders haphazardly was a pretty risky proposition. In response, some governments started limiting American immigration and seizing Americans' property. A dude named Albert Wells, for example, had his new mine and home in Segovia, Nicaragua, just fucking taken. For a man who'd welcomed Walker's new racial order, it was a bitter pill to swallow. Walker, too, lost out, but on a more uh, more than just his fortune. In 1860, British authorities turned him over to the Honduran government, and they executed that motherfucker at the age of 36. And not surprised, that's how he met his end. He definitely seemed like a live by the sword, die by the sword kind of guy. Uh, Still, even though they were met with local and governmental resistance, many Americans continued to dream of a U.S.-dominated Central America. They even hoped that would help settle the slavery debate raging in America in the 1860s if freed slaves would now colonize there. U.S. Postmaster General General, uh, Montgomery Blair predicted that black settlers would create rich colonies under our protection and transform all of Central America into our India. The New York York Independent agreed, uh, in addition to spreading U.S. Protestantism to lands where, quote, papal dogmas and ceremonies engrafted upon old Indian superstitions have so long held sway, colonization would ensure that the problem of the future development of the Negro race under the conditions of freedom and self-government may be solved in part in Central America. To the U.S. government's chagrin, however, only Haiti and Colombia agreed to accept black colonies, the latter in their Panama province only. Uh, the rest of the Central American states refused all proposals for African-American uh, resettlement. But soon a new opportunity would arise for America to infiltrate and take over Central America in a different way for all intents and purposes. The sexy, sexy banana market. Nature's dildos. Nature's pegging shafts. And then when you're done pegging and all hungry for a snack, you just peel and eat. If you're careful enough, you don't even have to wash your hands or something like that. That's, that's too much for me. But you know, when it comes to nanas, I, I try not to kink shame. Uh, the whole making crazy nana dollars down by the equator industry started off so small. In 1870, a 30 year old sailor from Massachusetts, Captain Lorenzo Dow, uh, Lorenzo Dow Baker, future nana baron, bought 160 bunches of bananas in Jamaica for a shilling per bunch and then sold them across the Hudson from Manhattan and Jersey City for two bucks each. Uh, that's more than bananas cost today. The average cost of a grocery store Nana in a U.S. grocery store, uh, less than 75 cents. Hard to really translate $1870 to today's dollars, but according to online inflation calculators, two bucks in 1870, rough equivalent of about 46 bucks now. And this dude bought a bunch of bananas for a shilling and a bunch has on average about 100 bananas in it. 
There are 20 shillings in a pound. And in 1870, a pound was the equivalent of about five US dollars. So one dollar was worth about four shillings. One shilling, right? Being worth about a quarter. So this guy bought a hundred bananas for a quarter and then sold each banana for two dollars. Even he, even if he lost half the, of those bananas to spoilage, he would still make $99.75 per bunch. And at 160 bunches, that would be $15,960. Profit, not counting what he had to pay his crew uh, for ship and for ship repairs. Those costs would be spread out over the rest of the goods he was carrying though. Again, using an online inflation calculator, if he lost half the bananas to spoilage, he still made $367,733 selling 160 bunches of bananas in today's money, not counting shipping costs. He was able to sell those bananas as an exotic luxury item. Bananas were not completely unknown in the States at that time, but they were very rare. Trading in them was extremely risky because they're highly perishable and not familiar to most Americans. But Baker gambled on bananas and his gamble paid off fucking big time, made a killing. And when he came to Boston with his next shipment in May of 1871, he met another nanner fella named Andrew Preston. Uh, at only 18, with only five years of formal schooling, Preston had been a produce dealer's assistant and he was a thoroughly calculating man. Uh, he had the typical New Englander's disdain for tropics, but realized the potential market for bananas specifically. And soon these two men would become co-founders of United Fruit. But they couldn't do that without infrastructure help from someone else. Uh, the very next year, 1871, the next future owner of United Fruit starts making his mark in Central America, Minor Cooper Keith. And that was his real name. Minor is not some weird qualifier or title. His first name was Minor, M-I-N-O-R. His dad's name also Minor, but different middle name. So he's not a junior. Doesn't seem to have had any siblings named Major, which I feel like is a missed opportunity. I have no idea how big Minor was, but I can't help but picture the tiniest little guy, little tiny Minor Keith. After taking out his uh, middle name, his first and last name sounds almost like you're saying Minor Key. Uh, I'll move on from my obsession with weird names now. Minor was born in Brooklyn, New York, January 19th, 1848, son of Minor Hubble Keith, a prosperous lumber merchant, and Emily Meigs, sister of railroad builder Henry Meigs. Ind uh, industry was in his DNA, and he was born with money to invest. He was educated in private schools until the age of 16 when he moved to Texas to manage a cattle ranch that his dad bought for him in 1869. Man, must be nice. Why, why did my dad buy me a cattle ranch? What do you want for your birthday? A cattle ranch, a very profitable Texas cattle ranch. Please, please, please buy me a cattle ranch, daddy. Uh, the younger miner, the little man, uh, no taller than five feet with a slender build, never weighed more than 115 pounds. Soon abandoned the cattle industry in 1871 when his uncle Henry Meigs invited him to work on a contract to build a railroad in Costa Rica. The railroad was to stretch from San Jose to the port of Limon, on the Caribbean coast, but Meigs had, uh, and Meigs had succeeded already at building the uh, Calajo Lima Railroad and the Oreja Railroad in Peru some years before. Miner accepted the invitation, enthusiastically went to Costa Rica with his two brothers to work on the railroad project. During the first 25 miles of construction, Meigs and the Keith brothers faced uh, some hardships. Uh, building the jungle was a lot more difficult than they had calculated since it, uh, disease and hard working conditions left an incredible or, you know, created an incredible cost. Uh, between four and 5,000 men died during construction, including Meigs and Minor Keith's brothers. Fucking malaria. And all these guys died during just 25 miles of laying down some track. In 1874, Minor, never taller than four foot, uh, six inch, and never heavier than 95, uh, the 90 pounds. He was left in charge of the project and stubbornly continued with it despite the odds. Large number of deaths made it hard for him to recruit new workers in Central America, so he was able to work out a deal with the state of Louisiana and recruit labor from some New Orleans jails. And these poor fuckers. Uh, sources don't say if they were given uh, a choice uh, in working for the jungle or some kind of exchange. I'm, I'm guessing uh, like a commuted sentence was offered, but it did not work out for them. With the 700 prisoners that he began with, it is estimated that only 25 survived to the end of the railroad's construction. <laughs> Fuck. That is terrible. Miner just burning through human life to make his railroad. If you were in charge of a construction project where dudes are dying by the thousands, would you abandon it at this point? Maybe you wouldn't want more blood in your hands or would you keep going not wanting the original sacrifices to have been made in vain? Honestly, not sure what I would do. I hate to say it, but being really fucking stubborn, I might just keep doubling down on a terrible idea in the name of, you know, not letting the rising death toll be in vain. Uh, when Miner brought a boat with 2,000 recent Italian immigrants from Louisiana, many of them rose in rebellion when they discovered the terrible working conditions. 
Many of them decided to run away. Excuse me. And then 60 of them died after getting lost in the jungle. This all sounds so fucking incredibly miserable. Miner kept going. He had a will much larger than his body. If he could survive this long in the tropics when he was never taller than maybe four foot nothing and never more than 75 pounds, he could finish this railroad. He decided to try a different group of immigrants, a decision rooted in racial assumptions of the time. Like most white Americans, Keith and his colleagues believed that black and most Asian workers were immune to tropical diseases like yellow fever and malaria. Uh, they were not. They were definitely not. But that's what he thought. As one of the railroad managers observed, I was always of opinion that it was a mistake to bring white laborers for that work on the coast. The Negroes and Chinese seemed to do better than any others. Initially, the American managers favored Asian contract laborers whom the company began to import in early of 1873. Like contemporary railroad, railroad builders in the American West, Keith and his colleagues viewed these workers as company-owned servants. In a February letter acknowledging the arrival of, quote, 562 Chinamen, uh, for example, Associate Williams Nan promised the railroad's company's New York supplier, W.R. Grace, to pay the value of these slaves by monthly installments. In fact, for years, both in Central America and North America, Chinese people were sold as if they are slaves for a certain term of years, observed U.S. diplomat George Williamson. He added the value of each Chinaman is computed according to the period he is still obliged to labor. When sold, it is agreed that he shall serve his new master for only said balance. Man, but then these guys kept dying too. Sources do not indicate numbers. Uh, sadly, I bet uh, little value was placed on their lives, such little value that no one bothered to keep track of how many were dying. Enough died for Keith and his associates to soon look to the British Caribbean as a promising source of new workers. And these workers would actually fare the best, although these new workers would be just as susceptible to malaria, as well as, you know, various respiratory illnesses common in the railroad squalid labor camps. Many, in fact, were immune to yellow fever due to childhood exposure. Also, British West Indians spoke English and many had experience in rail construction, including a number of former employees of the Panama Railroad. As early as September of 1873, Minor Keith happily reported that 621 men arrived from Jamaica last month and 200 more were expected. By 1882, Keith had carried the construction of the railroad 70 miles from the coast to Rio uh, Susio, but he was running out of money and received no help from the Costa Rican government who had defaulted on some promised payments. So he obtained a 1.2 million pound loan. The only problem was there was nobody to work on it. He'd used up his supply of workers from the West Indies. They'd either died or quit. In desperation, Keith once again turned to Southern Europe, importing over 1,500 Italians in 1887. Uh, they didn't work out either. In October of 1888, they went on strike. Sick of uh, many of them, no exact number, dying of tropical diseases, poor working conditions for those who remained, and delayed and shitty pay. Over 700 survivors made their way to San Jose and asked to be returned home. Keith demanded that Costa Rican authorities force them back to work. How dare they not want to die in the jungle for almost no money? But the government instead invited the strikers to settle in Costa Rica and uh, roughly 700 accepted and then the rest sailed for Italy. Miner still pushed forward to finish the railroad and he did finish it. He cut the damn ribbon himself at uh, no more than three feet tall, maybe 60 pounds. Miner had to stand atop a little ladder to do so, but he did it. Then once the railroad was completed, he faced a new problem. There were now not enough passengers to travel on it. Operating costs could not be paid, not to mention the huge debts Miner had to pay back for construction. But then necessity being the mother of invention, maybe desperation being its father, he quickly found that he could keep the business alive by exporting the fruit of a shit ton of banana trees. Not really trees, but they're called trees uh, that he planted as an experiment along his railroad tracks. The bananas had previously been used just to feed workers, but now he figured he could use the bananas as an export product. This new desperate experiment proved successful, very successful. And soon Minor Cooper Keith owned three banana export companies. By 1890, his trains were solely used for transporting bananas and the new banana plantations quickly built around the tracks ended up surpassing the value of the railway itself. After all the trouble he went through when building the railroad, now the 1890s are looking promising for Keith. He managed to become a very influential and respected man in Costa Rican society. He married Christina Castro, the daughter of the president, a woman who stood three feet taller than the mighty little fella who had never stood more than 30 inches high and never weighed more than 40 pounds. He spent most of his honeymoon with her playing horsey, making her carry her uh, carry him around on her, on her back and running around the pool. And then he worked as the main negotiator for some Costa Rican foreign debt with English banks. Now he started dreaming of an even bigger railroad, one that would stretch from North America to Central America. It would be built mainly for one purpose, to ship bananas to the U.S. and Canada. Beginning to act on this plan during a business trip to London, 
Minor Keith organized the Tropical Trading and Transport Company to coordinate the banana business and to provide transportation to increasing shipments in the U.S. In addition, the new company managed a chain of stores that he established along the Costa Rican coasts. He also expanded his banana business to the region of Magdal- Magdalena, Colombia, through the Colombian Land Company, and made a deal to export fruit from there to the States with the Snyder Banana Company of Panama, which was again at that time part of Colombian territory. All this was encouraged by state governments who did whatever Miner and his peers asked of them. The citizens would be massively exploited, but the new industry would grease the palms of local politicians big time. Sweeping land reforms were quickly passed that required plots to be placed under individual titles. In Guatemala, by breaking up Maya communal lands, these new ownership laws opened new real estate to coffee and banana planters by undermining communal substance. Local indigenous Maya peoples had their ancestral lands taken from them with these laws, along with their traditional way to provide for themselves. They virtually had no choice now but to work for the companies that had fucking taken their lands. They didn't speak English, had no Western education, and thus had no ability to advocate for themselves or negotiate in any fashion. In many countries, a new reform tax structure also burdened Central Americans with new cash tax obligations to their governments which accelerated their abandonment of traditional substance farming. And they now too had no choice but to get whatever cash paying jobs were available to them. And those jobs were menial labor jobs, generally for like uh, banana uh, plantations now many places. They were essentially forced to enter a wage labor system on the bottom rung in order to just survive. More and more legislation converted locals into mobile seasonal wage earning labors useful to foreign employers. Legislation local officials uh, were undoubtedly pressured to pass by new foreign business moguls like Minor Keith, men born with giant silver spoons up their asses who probably had no fucking sympathy for the plight of those born with nothing. When any indigenous groups resisted, leaders of Central American governments enforced the new laws with rural police and a professionalized military organized and trained by foreign investors. Right? Don't want to uh, get a job to pay your taxes? Fine. You'll just be arrested, jailed, and then loaned out to these companies to be used as conscripted labor. Soon another company would surface to challenge miners' Nana preeminence. Let's back up just a little bit to 1885. That was the year the Boston Fruit Company formed, the brainchild of Captain Lorenzo Baker and Andrew Preston, who started selling bananas in New England in 1870. Now in 1885, they officially incorporate The Boston Fruit Company, established with capital of $20,000, over $600,000 in today's dollars. In the 1880s and 1890s, Boston Fruit relied mostly on animal power, carriages pulled by donkeys to get fruit from field to ship. Independent producers moved the harvested fruit, meaning that profits were vulnerable for delay if there was an issue with animals or the dirt roads. In October of 1891, Boston Fruit agent Cecil Langlois, or Langlois, ah, fucking, who who knows? Fucking weird name I'm not familiar with. Uh, fruit agent Cecil fucking who gives a shit uh, complained that the weather was taking a toll in the fruit harvest in Jamaica uh, where even empty carriages sank up to their axles loaded wagons fared even worse the roads were so bad that pickers could not reach banana cultivations they started to minimize the use of mules and oxen and built their own rail line that went in between properties in Jamaica after the line's construction was completed in 1898 company agent Stephen Hislop happily wrote to Lorenzo Baker's son that the run from plantation to port took only 30 minutes now The very next year, someone else's transportation failure would greatly increase the fortune of what is to become United Fruit. In 1899, Hoadley and Company, a New York broker corporation that lent Minor Keith a million and a half dollars, declared bankruptcy. And teeny, tiny, little itty bitty Minor Keith, no more than two feet tall tops ever, maybe 20 pounds soaking wet, lost all his money. The Costa Rican government and several members of the local elite made efforts to help uh, help him in his new crisis, but Minor Keith's financial situation did not improve. As a last resort, he headed to Boston to talk with Andrew Preston and Lorenzo Baker. The Boston Fruit Company was Miner's rival, and he hoped a merger of the two companies would end his debt, and the two sides would agree to terms. And the United Fruit Company is born March 30th, 1899. That April, the newly acquired, uh, newly, sorry, that April, the newly already incorporated United Fruit Company acquires seven independent companies that have been operating in Honduras. This new company was led by Andrew Preston, who had spent much of the 1890s forming a refrigerated distribution network to sell bananas to a national market. Refrigerating green, unripened bananas can extend their life for weeks. Minor Keith served as vice president, never more than 18 inches tall, maybe 10 pounds. It said his office was a a golden birdcage. Three men brought uh, complimentary interests or brought complimentary interests and skills that quickly made the new company very lucrative. Keith had his railroad network and plantations in Central America, plus the market in the U.S., 
uh, and Preston grew bananas in the West Indies, ran a steamship fleet called the Great White Fleet, which brought bananas to New England. As the company grew, Keith Cog, uh, continued with his railroad projects in Central America, which would create further growth and profit. Together, Baker, Preston, and Keith gained control of vast areas of tropical growing regions, uh, brought all this under cultivation, and built an extensive and carefully controlled means of rail and water transportation and refrigeration. In addition to clearing lands, draining swamps, and building housing and branch rail lines, they remapped the landscape, christening banana farms with names of American cities like Boston, Chicago, New York, and Buffalo, as well as with titles resonant uh, of the American empire, such as Manila, after gaining the Philippines and the Spanish-American War of 1898, and their empire grew and grew. Uh, when Preston announced the first dividends of $2.50 a share in December of 1899, the company controlled 250,000 acres in Colombia, Cuba, Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. More than 100 square miles of the almost 400 square miles of land they owned had uh, producing banana trees. A few years later, more banana land was bought in Guatemala. On its vast estates, the company employed around 15,000 people and operated 11 steamships, chartered 20 to 30 more vessels, and ran its 300 boxcars and 17 locomotives over more than 100 miles of laid track, uh, laid exclusively for linking the banana plantations with its coastal warehouses. As the company expanded, it transformed coastal towns into commercial hubs full of foreigners of all kinds. Puerto Cortez boasted a Frenchified community dominated by names like Debrot, Anois, Coron, as well as a hotel run by Mrs. Barad. I'm probably fucking those French names up, but <laughs> something like that. There's more French town. A uh, great town in Bluefields in Nicaragua had British and German merchants and businessmen. Other ports had residents of various other nationalities, including Syrians, Jamaicans, and Chinese. But not all of these diverse people were in charge or even in positions of power. In fact, there were... Uh, there was a clear corporate hierarchy with white men at the top. At the head of the division was the general manager who reported directly to company headquarters in Boston. Beneath him, a small number of superintendents oversaw districts, each of which consisted of several banana farms. Each farm was in turn ran by a mandador, assisted by two timekeepers in charge of recording the hours worked by the predominantly Jamaican laborers. With the exception of the foreman, often drawn from the workers' ranks, supervisory jobs were restricted to whites. To fill these positions, United Fruit initially hired Americans and Europeans already residing in the region, including a number of former adventurers. As it pushed to professionalize its ranks, however, the company began to recruit more educated American men to staff its divisions. All this came out of a uh, paternalistic ideology where United Fruit and its white managers believed, again, they were helping transform the backwards region. This would persist within the company's rhetoric for the following decades. Frederick Upham Adams writing a classic study of the United, of United Fruit in 1914, predicted that the future inhabitants of the lowland tropics would bow with gratitude before the company's achievements and will realize that all this was made possible by the American citizens who were the pioneers in their conquest of the tropics. Uh, backing up to 1900, United Fruit and a few emerging foreign comp competitors, as they're making all this fucking nano money, they do not want to compete with any local growers or any individual sellers. They want to own everything from growing to harvesting to distribution. Previously, they had worked alongside some local producers in this emerging market. In letters, Lorenzo Baker Sr. advised his son that we want to keep hold of the large producers as much as possible and recommended going to occasionally see these people and see that they are not getting dissatisfied. He wrote to others that Lorenzo Jr. knew how to massage the little growers much better than I can. Maintaining these relationships was key to beating their corporate competition. But now this attitude of working with locals would change. Started with telling the local growers, you know, what to do and when so that United Fruit could time things exactly right to get the bananas to the U.S. before they spoiled. Occasional errors in harvest timing, usually brought about by lack of communication between independent suppliers, resulted in a product that nobody could sell, a rotten banana. Preston now began to communicate the difficulties of making high-grade fruit while depending on independent planters to Baker Jr. in another letter, saying, I hope you may be able to secure fruit in some way as we shall need it badly here if it is full, clean, and bright, which fact I presume you can establish if you have control of the cutting. The time has passed when importers can make a profit on thin and ordinary fruit. When they did get bad fruit, United Fruit organized so that those fruits would be sold to competitors, not under the United Fruit name. And then by the end of the 19th century, United Fruit was disillusioned with the idea of collaborating with local growers at all. Time for them to own everything. So they did just that. 
Then in 1902, United Fruit expands to Cuba and they take over things. They are just like they did in Central America. Following year, a new problem pops up that banana barons uh, still deal with today. In 1903, the plant disease known as Panama disease appears for the first time in United Fruit plantations in Panama. This disease attacks the plant's tree roots, cutting off the water supply. Thousands of acres of banana plantations now have to be abandoned. That same year, United Fruit introduces refrigerated ships to its transportation system. Uh, This advancement reduced the rate of overripe fruit, arriving in U.S. ports from around 12% to just 2%. By 1904, Preston could write to stockholders that the largest steamers in the United Fruit Company's fleet have been fitted with the cooling equipment, which permits the delivery to the trade in the interior of the choicest fruit in the best of conditions. That same year, on May 4th, construction began on the Panama Canal. The path to the Panama Canal had been a long one marked by a French effort to do the same thing in the 1880s, followed by the U.S. government acquiring the rights in 1903. But since the canal zone was still in Colombian territory, Colombia rejected U.S. plans. In response, the U.S. government threw its military weight behind a Panamanian independence movement, which was successful, that led to a a great deal for the U.S. with a, uh, a new puppet government they helped install. The Republic of Panama granted America exclusive and permanent possession of the Panama Canal Zone now. In exchange, Panama received $10 million and an annuity of $250,000 beginning nine years later. The seizure of Panama spurred Washington toward in, towards imperial supervision of the region, which U.S. officials considered essential to promoting American business interests as well as protecting the future canal. Part of this imperial supervision was assuming the debts of Panama, Panama and then later other Central American countries, having those debts transferred to U.S. creditors and giving the U.S. government leverage over those states. Roosevelt announced this policy in December of 1904. Although promising that responsible nations need fear no interference from the United States, he warned the governments that failed to maintain order or pay their debts would force the United States to exercise an international police power. This was a new Monroe Doctrine practice known as dollar diplomacy. Uh, It would become a mainstay of the U.S. government's dealings with Central America. Almost a decade later, in his message to Congress on December 3rd, 1912, U.S. President Taft would characterize this program as substituting dollars for bullets. Over the coming decades, the U.S. would use dollar diplomacy to throw out leaders that, you know, we didn't like and install new ones that we did. Dollar diplomacy was uh, also established, also established, excuse me, collecting customs by U.S. officials. And we started giving loans to Central American governments, loans that made them more beholden to Washington. More and more Central Americans are reading the writing on the wall now, and they're not loving it. As early as 1907, Congressional Deputy Ricardo Jimenez warned fellow Costa Ricans of the linkage between corporate power and imperial domination. He said in a speech, uh, I think it was a speech, not a letter. Yes, he he said in a speech, there are some who make fun of us for thinking that United Fruit President Andrew Preston could come and take over Costa Rica for himself. It's a pity that these writers haven't read the history of modern conquest carefully. India did not lose its independence because Great Britain had declared war on the Indian princes. It was a merchant company, similar to United Fruit Company, which created English interests there and was the precursor to Great Britain's regular armies. Jimenez would claim, in trying to take over our territories, they don't believe they are coming to conquer and prey on us. They are coming to claim their rights to fulfill the manifest destiny of their race. Jimenez was a smart dude. He knew exactly what the fuck was up. Uh, Sadly, he would be powerless to stop what he saw going on. Now let's back up a bit again. 1904, Guatemala, Guatemalan dictator Manuel Estrada Cabrera uh, grants United Fruit a 99-year concession to construct and maintain the company's or the country's main rail line from Guatemala City to Puerto Barrios. The company uh, keeps growing in both power and profit. In 1906, United Fruit purchases 50% of the shares of the Vaccaro Brothers Company in Honduras, their primary emerging competitor. Just fucking takes them over. Also in 1906, United Fruit uh, erects two radio stations in eastern Nicaragua. Uh, The company already owned a 200-foot transmission tower at Bocas del Toro, Panama. They will control transportation in the region and communication. When the conservative New England stockholders complained at the expense of operating the stations, each word cost 50 bucks to broadcast, Preston confidently retorted that in the uncertainty of the banana business, a word was sometimes worth $50. uh, $50. And United Fruit was expanding into more than radio. As United Fruit expanded its operations along the Central American coast, it sought control of more property suitable for banana production and shipping, including land, warehouses, railroads, wharfs, and steamships. From the moment the green bunches were whacked from the trees until they were unloaded in the States, United Fruit reigned. 
They owned the land the bananas were grown on, the railroads used to ship the bananas to the coast, the ports where the ships they also owned docked, and then transported the bananas to destinations to be purchased. Almost all of the labor force was indigenous, West Indian black, or Hispanic, with West Indian black workers making up most of the labor force. And as we'll get into uh, here before long, they basically owned these guys too. By 1909, United Fruits workforce is getting pretty angry. They were tired of being excluded from the upper ranks. As in one case, when in response to an application for a managerial position from a West Indian man named William Harton in July of 1909, General Manager R.J. Schwepp bluntly inquired, what is your nationality and are you a white man? On December 7th, a surprise pay cut on a plantation in Costa Rica leads to protests. In response, the farm's white timekeeper declares, Mr. Smith says you are all getting too much pay. He says $30 a month is enough for you, insert racial slur here. Uh, news of the racial slur uh, and pay reduction spread quickly among the laborers who were already simmering over their poor treatment in that enclave. And then things would get worse. December 16th, the farm's timekeeper shot a Jamaican man named George Reed for protesting. Upon learning of Reed's death, hundreds of West Indians turned their anger on the farm's commissary. This led to more bloodshed. As a white, sto- as a white store clerk named E.H. Tennyson shot at least one West Indian before fleeing. Some strikers pursued Tennyson while the rest marched towards the Dartsmouth farm, demanding that all workers refuse to load banana trains until the company agreed to wage increases. Late on December 17th, the United Fruit official wired higher-ups that 400 Jamaican laborers are on strike and drunk and raising a riot. Warning that the local garrisons were unable to restore order, a request was sent for 175 Guatemalan troops. Guatemala's Minister of War demanded that Guatemalan troops not use force against the strikers except as a last resort. Guatemalan troops peacefully occupied the troubled plantations on December 18th. Nevertheless, the situation, of course, remained tense. And six days later, a U.S. employee in the region reported that the number of strikers had grown to 600, most of whom were equipped with some sort of firearm and not in the best of temper. Despite United Fruit's continued demands for repression, however, Guatemalan troops held back, almost certainly due to the presence of some British diplomats in the area. Britain at that time ruled over a portion of Guatemala that would later become Belize. A part of Belize. Uh, in the week following the uprising, another British vice consul, Godfrey Haggard, conducted an investigation into the living conditions and labor practices in United Fruits Enclave. He concluded that the strikers had very legitimate grievances. In addition to United Fruits' manipulation of its payroll, he reported West Indians complained of high-handed treatment and cursing and being threatened with revolvers. Cursing's kind of funny. Like, the, 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 profane, the profane language, no one cares for. All of this trouble could have been avoided, he concluded, had the firm assumed a more sympathetic and tactful attitude towards its black employees. Well, of course, United Fruit officials disagreed. Elsewhere, workers are dissatisfied too. In early 1910, some 8,000 of the company's Jamaican laborers around Limon organized the Artesians and Laborers Union. Soon after, union leaders announced that a general strike will commence on August 1st, West Indian Emancipation Day. The union's leadership reached out to their Hispanic co-workers, claimed that uh, both groups were being mistreated. As West Indian dock worker William Cohen publicly declared, the company mistreats Jamaicans and Hispanic uh, workers, and because of this, we don't want to work. This move towards working class unity between races uh, very much concerned United Fruit officials. One tool the company was using to break up the union was its leverage over West Indian communal institutions. Many black churches and fraternal societies resided on company land and received some funding from the firm. Managers now pulled on these strings to weaken support for the strike. In one letter, General Manager Schwepp uh, scolded a West Indian reverend named John Henderson for talking against the company that gives you bread and butter and ordered him to attend strictly and only to your religious duties. Schwepp also threatened to withhold the firm's annual funding of the West Indian Emancipation Day celebration. At the same time, the company accused Hispanic troublemakers of stirring unrest amongst uh, supposedly previously content black workers. Indeed, Schwepp uh, blamed the entire strike on a Honduran labor organizer who has been exploiting our labor and causing us considerable trouble. United Fruit now called upon the Costa Rican government, you know, uh, that they basically owned and demanded they end the strike. After a long meeting with Schwepp on July 24th, Costa Rican President Ricardo Jimenez spoke with workers and felt the strike would be avoided. United Fruit were confident Jimenez will put down any insubordination, but the strike still occurred. It began on August 1st as planned, dragged on through the fall and November. Schwepp now imported 680 strike breakers from the British colony of St. Kitts. But the predominantly Jamaican strikers undercut this move by reaching out to their fellow British subjects and forming the newcomers of the poor treatment and wage cuts that led to the strike. In response, most of the St. Kitts men refused to work. 
causing the company to threaten them with enforcement of Costa Rica's vagrancy law. Tensions mounted further as the now hungry newcomers started demanding food. Then on November 24th, a group of St. Kitts men attacked a company commissary after its white clerk struck one of them with an axe handle. In response, United Fruit called in the Costa Rican police who brawled with the rioters now. Clashes continued the following day as Jamaican workers poured in from outlying banana farms and the Costa Rican government now dispatches 250 troops to Limon. Uh, the riot led many Hispanic Union members to actually join the strike breakers and call for the repression of their West Indian co-workers. Finally, Costa Rican authorities deported the strike leaders and by the end of 1910, the union had collapsed. They gutted it. Seemed like everything was back to status quo, but it wasn't. Now white conductors and engineers inspired by the Jamaican Union presented a petition demanding higher pay and shorter hours for them. The solution for United, Fre- uh, for United Fruit was to pay the white workers a little bit more, but only so they would be loyal to the company and then do their part in putting down any disgruntled Hispanic and black workers going forward. Starting in 1911, United Fruit considered abusing workers to keep them under control part of the job. They considered it essential that a number of their white workers be able to put down non-white laborers as like a primary work responsibility. And they began to hire, for lack of a better term, fucking enforcers. One person who would attest to this was a young ambassador named Hugh Wilson. In early 1912, 26-year-old Hugh learned of his appointment as a U.S. ambassador in Guatemala City. In Guatemala, he was met by the general manager of United Fruits Guatemala Division, Victor M. Cutter. He described him with a broad grin on a rugged, clean-shaved face. Cutter was a picturesque, huge figure in tropical white. As the young diplomat followed Cutter down the gangway, he caught his first glimpse of United Fruit's workforce. He wrote, In the black, moist night, a line of Negroes stripped to the waist and barefooted, each bent under the load of a huge bunch of bananas, strode up the wharf, where they passed their burden into the hold through a chain gang of handlers. Wilson added that Cutter's handling of Negroes was remarkable and that he, quote, excelled in everything they admired. He could fight the wildest of them. He could outshoot them. His endurance was unlimited and his occasional flash of ferocious temper kept them cowed. Such qualities were essential, he said. He explained these Negroes from Jamaica were cheerful and reasonably industrious, but full of liquor, they became dangerous. Cutter would face them down in their worst moments. But white brawlers like Cutter were pretty hard to find. More and more Americans were afraid to work in Central America in this tropical climate where, you know, if they weren't getting like, uh, Attacked by people understandably fucking angry with their jobs, they could succumb to uh, disease. The U.S. medical establishment uh, held that white people were not suitable for the tropics at this time. So now United Fruit tries to fix that. A new lab is set up with a hospital zone to treat workers and a research facility to continue progress on understanding and treating tropical diseases. By contrast, the sick camps for laborers were separate and basic, as common belief held that they weren't really able to maintain themselves anyway. <laughs> Jesus. As Dr. W. E. Deeks, a consultant for the Canal Commission and future head of United Fruits Medical Department explained, as elsewhere in the world, the enforcement of sanitation among the Negroes is a gigantic task. The European laborer, though he mingles with the natives, does not live with them. But the Negro lives and sleeps in their houses, exposing himself constantly to the endemic malarial infection. As long as he has a roof over his head and a yam or two to eat, he is content. And his ideal of personal hygiene is on par with his conception of marital fidelity. God damn. Fucking Dr. Deeks. Oh, man. Even doctors. So fucking dumb back then compared to uh, now. Uh, Well, compared to some people now. Uh, Equally dumb to other people now. Uh, Laborers' medical facilities were actually openly called second class by the company because, of course, the ones for white supervisors were first class. Labor medical facilities also weren't even staffed by medical professionals. In the first-class facilities, patients were tended to by white female nurses who had been educated and trained in the U.S., but those white women were not allowed to be around black male patients. So they often received care from quote-unquote doctors and nurses with little or no formal education. Also in 1912, the U.S. faces opposition to dollar diplomacy in Nicaragua. Using dollar diplomacy, President Howard Taft had installed Adolfo Diaz, former employee of a U.S. mining company, to now fucking lead the nation. Just a total puppet regime. The new president immediately signed a protectorate treaty granting Washington full control over Nicaraguan finances, rights to a naval base, and an exclusive option on a Nicaraguan canal if the U.S. wanted one. Now anti-American sentiment rises in the nation with citizens not interested in being led by puppets in the pocket of D.C. American journalist William Hale attributed Central American distrust to the region's chaotic racial mixtures. He declared that the protectorate was the only way to govern the, quote, sad-faced, dull-witted Indians of Nicaragua. 
Uh, State Department official and former U.S. minister to Costa Rica, Louis Einstein, would say the heterogeneous nature of the region's population, apart from Costa Rica, and the existence in the other countries of a majority of Indian and Negro Indian blood inevitably spawned instability, which in turn threatened U.S. enterprise, including not only the Panama Canal, but U.S.-owned railroads, mines, and banana plantations close to the coast. In 1912, after a fierce price competition against the United Fruit Company, Another rival, the Atlantic Fruit Company, declares bankruptcy. Atlantic had been the United Fruit's uh, main competitor in Costa Rica. And after the bankruptcy, United Fruit takes complete control of the country's banana exports. Next year, United Fruit would acquire more railway and land concessions in Honduras. Same year, the Senate Finance Committee of the U.S. includes bananas in the proposed Underwood-Simmons tariff. Bananas would be taxed at five cents a bunch. This initiative uh, faces strong opposition from the New York Times, the Tariff Reform Committee of the Reform Club, the Banana Buyers Protective Association, and randomly the the Housewives League. Uh, The lobby made by these organizations eventually succeeds, and the U.S. government permits the tax-free import of bananas to continue. So banana barons, they're getting whatever the fuck they want domestically and abroad. They're just making so much money. Money talks. Uh, Yeah, so much much money in America's new favorite fruit. Uh, Meanwhile, United Fruit continues to segregate workers. In addition to housing Hispanics and blacks separately, it assigns them different tasks and wages based upon race, routinely placing West Indians in charge of Spanish-speaking work gangs. All very intentional, right? Again, divide the workers, get them to fight each other instead of their superiors. Reminds me uh, of American politics, right? Get the populace to believe that the heart of the battle is between, uh, I don't know, whites and non-whites or citizens and immigrants or conservatives and liberals instead of the poor and working classes versus uh, corporate oligarchs, which it usually is. Right, distract us with social issues while the military industrial complex and massive international conglomerates continue to get Washington to feed the shareholders and CEOs at the expense of literally everyone else. Uh, demeaned by American managers and uh, often subordinate to black foremen who also didn't like them, many Hispanics responded by channeling their resentment towards West Indian coworkers. These patterns grew more pronounced during World War I. Desperate for employment during wartime shortages, thousands of Hispanic workers from throughout the region make their way to United Fruits banana enclaves, particularly in Costa Rica and Guatemala. Once there, however, they find West Indians holding positions on the firm's shrinking payrolls. The resulting competition for jobs exacerbated the racial tension already embedded in the company's labor labor structure. Soon, Central American migrants are demanding restrictions on black immigration and preferential hiring for Spanish speakers. Hispanic officials in Guatemala in particular respond with increased harassment of West Indian immigrants, which only adds to racial division amongst laborers. And this will have tragic results. On the evening of Saturday, May 9th, 1914, Nathan Gordon and Alfred Essen, two Jamaican workers in United Fruits Guatemala Division, are walking on the outskirts of the company's uh, Tijuana farm when they are attacked by four Hispanic men. Gordon escapes. Essen not so lucky. After receiving machete wounds to his hands and face, he is shot to death. Following day, an enraged group of Jamaicans march to a Hispanic workers camp near Tijuana to settle the score. After failing to locate the murderers, they kill two Guatemalan men unconnected to the attack and threaten to do the same to all the Spanish men and women alike. The rampage ends when three African-American workers convince the Jamaicans to return to their barracks. The rampage ends temporarily. The violence really just beginning. Informed by the commander of the nearby Los Amates garrison that more than 60 armed Negroes were killing all the Guatemalan, Guatemalan inhabitants, Guatemalan President Estrada Cabrera orders the provincial governor to, quote, take any steps you think necessary to repress the evil. Guatemalan troops arrive at United Fruits District headquarters at uh, Quirigua in the early morning hours of May 12th. Soon became clear that their mission was not to capture the killers, but to terrorize West Indian residents in mass. When dawn breaks, soldiers harass, beat, and shoot indiscriminately at black laborers who are on their way to work, wounding or killing an unrecorded number. Then over the following two days, they invade the uh, Tijuana, uh, Kiche and Mixco farms, killing several more West Indians, looting black homes and making sweeping arrests. Since no Americans have been threatened, U.S. diplomats showed little interest in all this and company officials seemed concerned only with disruption of operations. The army's attacks caused most remaining West Indian workers to flee, virtually emptying the three plantations. As one timekeeper on the Mixco plantation complained, there are only about 10 racial slur uh, left on this farm. Many of these fleeing West Indian workers entered the British Army. Others made their way to Cuba and Panama. In Cuba, one of the largest employers would be none other than United Fruit. They fucking run away from United Fruit to get back to another place dominated by United Fruit. As in Central America, black immigrants in Cuba uh, faced nativist hostility 
which became evident during a sugar strike in February of 1917. Although British uh, West Indians played little role in in the work stoppage, Cuban officials targeted them, scapegoated them for repression and carried out at least one massacre of an untold number of Jamaican workers. This upheaval, which threatened the property of United Fruit and other sugar interests, in turn prompted the U.S. military occupation of eastern Cuba. In 1917, a land dispute between rival fruit company uh, Cuyamel and United Fruit along the border of Honduras and Guatemala drives uh, the two countries nearly to war. The war is avoided, but the countries are left more reliant than ever on the fruit companies to solve problems in the aftermath. In August of 1919, the, the Honduran state is forced to ask United Fruit and some competitors like Cuyamel for funds to put down another rebellion. The financial leverage enabled the companies to carve up Honduras's Caribbean coast with little state interference. United Fruit took the land surrounding the ports of Tela and Puerto Castilla. Having learned their lesson in Costa Rica and Guatemala, they immediately established a segmented workforce, hiring local Hispanics as well as recruiting British West Indians. In addition to using ethnic and racial divisions, United Fruit uh, depended on Honduran authorities to intimidate and discipline workers, particularly West Indians. But West Indians were not the only recipients of abuse. Spanish-speaking laborers who came to the enclave found themselves treated as inferiors in their own country. According to the wife of one United Fruit engineer, Americans routinely bossed and humiliated Hispanic workers, especially in the enclave's early years. Although the company publicly maintained that it deplored conflict between West Indian and Central American workers, its strategy of fomenting such tension was an open secret. Or tensions, I guess there. Uh, U.S. Consul John J. Miley observed that it was that it used, quote, mixed gangs to prevent worker resistance and that dissension between West Indian and Hispanic workers was favored, if not more or less openly encouraged, by the labor policy of the United Fruit Company in order to render effective organization less likely. As part of this strategy, he explained, the firm also ran its own secret service that employed West Indians to gather information among workers and disrupt and labor uh, and disrupt labor organizations into unions or, you know, or uh, organizing into unions or planning strikes. Excuse me. Man. Uh, Now let's look at the case study of one man who will personalize a lot of the shit I've been talking about. Uh, The letters a man named Everett Brown wrote, thankful that his family kept them. uh, They go a long ways into illustrating how shitty United Fruit was. In August of 1919, Bostonian Everett Brown disembarked from a United Fruit Company ship in Antia, Cuba, ready to begin a tropical career in the transnational's rapidly expanding sugar division of Preston. Brown went from working as a timekeeper and draughtsman on railroad construction in Cuba to being promoted to engineer and transferred to Panama, where a few months later he headed a survey crew carving the forested Talamanca, Talamanca Valley into more banana plantations. He was given a published pamphlet of instructions for field engineers and draftsmen in 1920 to help prepare himself. Addressed to the young engineer unfamiliar with the tropics, Arthur Henry Bestor laid out a series of technical practices to its wide employees, heading surveying crews on the expanding edges of the company's property. It is the custom to allow the Negroes and natives to do most of the manual labor, the author of the fruit company's manual noted, the supervisory and technical tasks only being suitable for whites. The new recruit would encounter both types of labor, and each posed its own challenges to foremen. The natives are usually very quick and are exceptionally good for woodland work, but are not very rugged or strong. Typically, they required several days rest a month. Man, what a bunch of weak little babies. Several days of rest a month? How's that that they couldn't perform rugged manual labor from dusk till dawn in a tropical climate where the temperature regularly gets into the 90s and the humidity often cracks over 70% and these babies improperly fed, drinking dirty water, still need a few days of rest a month? That's fucking absurd. That's a complaint. And then the right, uh, the Negroes, on the other hand, are more regular and steady, but not so quick to learn. They seemingly get along best when employed in the same kind of work and cannot readily be charged or changed from one duty to another. The author cautioned his readership to avoid the temptation of depending on black workers or natives to clean and maintain the uh, surveyor's instruments, tools he considered far beyond their limited comprehension. Fuck's sake. Uh, Brown would perform exactly the role Henry Beston, or Beston, excuse me, described. Don and a new Stetson carrying a revolver in case anyone gets out of hand. He sets about plotting the lines of the forest at the head of 15 non-white laborers. When these laborers on his crew uh, go on strike, wanting a dollar 50 a day, a situation Brown described as quite a circus, he similar, oh my gosh, summarily dismisses the lot of them even those who did not participate in the strike. Uh, that, that amount, by the way, equivalent to 22 bucks a day, according to inflation, calcul- inflation calculators, for 10 hours of hard work. 
Uh, Brown, just like United Fruit expected, uh, lower level white men would be if they were paid better and thus became loyal to the company. He was pleased with how he did. He wrote uh, his wife after the incident, of course it is all new and strange and I own to rather enjoying this being a little tin god. All right. Uh, Brown made his subordinates address him with their hand, hats in their hand, a privilege he certainly had not had as a middle-class man in America. Uh, the racial hierarchy woven through the company's tropical world made Brown's life uh, better in another way too, by providing him with personal servants, so-called, quote, houseboys, whose cost was included as part of lodging, both in Cuba and Panama. Basically, every part of United Fruit, uh, you know, uh, did its best to affirm these men so that they, in turn, would keep the black and Hispanic workforce subservient. After work, Brown would read things like the Employee Magazine, Unifruit Co. Sounds like a fucking boring-ass magazine. Or maybe Playboy for banana fuckers. Uh, Brown read things like this article from a United Fruit employee in Honduras, which argued that Anglo-Saxon men possess character traits necessary to subdue the tropics. It said the Anglo-Saxon man was a cool-headed, persevering, enterprising, practical man. And this is a Prospero Alger writing and responsible in large part for the advances made by the modern world in the fields of business, commerce, and material progress. He was expert at adapting himself to new circumstances and was imbued with a singular reverence for law and order. These virtues, concluded Alger, meant that other races have a great deal to learn from the Anglo-Saxons. Conversely, recurring portrayals of non-white workers in Unifruit Co. spoke to their defects. Cartoons lampoon blacks and native Central Americans and timekeepers and overseers from the company's farms offered their own, quote, humorous anecdotes. One such portrayal described Jones, a Jamaican working in Honduras. Like most Jamaicans, wrote overseer John Erskine, Jones wanted money and was willing to do almost anything but good work for it. This is in an employee magazine mocking an entire class of employee. The article went on to describe how the feckless man cut corners in banana planting that led to crop losses and took time away from his paid work in various petty money-making schemes. Erskine conveyed the lessons he learned from Jones. You must judge everything these men do on its own merits and then forget it, as they will. I'm not even entirely sure what that fucking means. In this telling, a Jamaican uh, could be made to do good work only with unrelenting supervision, a role that could only be filled by the right sort of man. But as my being the right sort of man, Brown and his colleagues also had a bone to pick with United Fruit, actually several bones. The North American engineers and lower level foremen around him complained incessantly and bitterly about living conditions and their treatment at the company's hands. Poor pay, high cost of living, a vacation policy that exacerbated homesickness and rigid, uncaring bosses. Uh, Brown's starting salary as a timekeeper and assistant to the engineering department, around 100 bucks a month, made for tight personal budgeting. With a wife and daughter to support in Massachusetts, he usually sent home at least 45 bucks a month, leaving them with very little money after room, board, and other expenses took the lion's share. This fucker is making between three and 350, uh, 350 a day, uh, you know, three bucks and $3.50 a day, complaining that it's a barely livable wage and yet happy to fire guys who wanted a buck 50 a day. Man, the oppressed helping oppress the even more oppressed. After his first two months in Cuba, he wrote that it is a pretty tight rub to get along on what I have, and I have not been able to do it yet. He had to borrow money from colleagues in Cuba to afford working in Cuba before he made it to Panama. Not only was United Fruit still not paying him a decent wage in Panama, he also had to pay for things that weren't exactly essential, but were essential if he wanted to progress in his career. These were things like company dances and other leisure activities which could cost each man between four and seven bucks a pop. Uh, these dances, other functions were made available only to white people. For Everett Brown, it wasn't the whites only policy, but the high price tag that made him balk at attending. For one particularly expensive Halloween dance in Guaro, Brown told his wife that he would try to get out of it, but feared creating bad feelings uh, amongst his peers. He noted with some bitterness that the single young men without his obligations could spend more freely on such, on such functions and on alcohol. I have to keep up some way, he felt, at least enough to keep them satisfied. In the end, he attended the that particularly expensive function, paying $4.30 for one night of entertainment, more than he made in a day. Uh, he wrote, uh, I saw that it would cause hard feeling if I did not. It is policy to pay it, for they would make it very unpleasant here if they chose. Brown felt such costs necessary for advancement. Soon after this particular dance, he overheard two of his supervisors weighing him uh, for a supervisory position in the agricultural department, which would have brought a significant uh, pay raise. Overhearing such a conversation made paying his way into the community an acceptable loss. Resigned, he exclaimed, I think it is policy 
just now not to start any antagonism, even if it hurts to pay the price. Other policies annoyed him too, like the fact that he wasn't allowed a horse to travel on for free during his time off. His new manager had nixed that policy in order to save money. So Brown and colleagues had to pay two bucks a day for the use of a horse. In doing so, that manager was keeping these men from uh, having contact with other U.S. companies, which offered better bonuses and higher wages than United Fruit. Making everything worse, Brown contracted malaria in Panama, and it would trouble him through the end of his time with the company. Almost a year into his tropical career, now an engineer in Panama, Brown called in a long-held promise for a vacation. After weeks of frustrated requests, the superintendent responded that vacations were granted, quote, as a reward of merit for services rendered and not as a regular occurrence. Brown reminded his boss that a vacation had been offered to him as an inducement to come to Panama and that he would resign if it were not granted. Uh, I have been led to believe it is my due, he grumbled in another uh, letter to his wife. In the end, the division manager, Mr. Blair, did not follow through on the agreement Brown made with the central office of the United Fruit uh, Company regarding a vacation. Blair argued that he would only grant a vacation as a reward for a full year service, regardless of whether or not, uh, uh, you know, this man had transferred in from another company division and possibly worked, you know, a longer time there. Brown discussed it with his treatment, sorely missing his family, resigned from United Fruit a month later. So after a year abroad, he's worse off physically and financially than he would have been if he would have just stayed in Boston and been exploited by some factory owner at home. At least then he would have been with his family. And this is a white American engineer being paid far more and treated far better than the average laborer. In February 1920, a massive strike by West Indian workers paralyzes the Canal Zone but it is soon crushed by U.S. and Panamanian authorities. No word on how many people were hurt or if any were killed. Amid a rising tide of Central American unity, a pro-labor movement and rising anti-black sentiment amongst locals, Hispanic workers helped convince the new Honduran president to ban Jamaican immigration in June of 1920. The dream of solidarity in the face of white superiors, of laborers of all races and nationalities standing together, that's gone there now. In Guatemala, uh, the same thing will take place. It announced that uh, foreigners arriving in Guatemala would be required to deposit $500 with customs officials. United Fruit protested this vigorously, noting that the law would cripple its operations. In response, Guatemalan officials reduced the requirement to $100 and privately assured company officials it would only uh, only be enforced for black immigrants. Guatemalan authorities stepped up their harassment of West Indians, particularly those who lived with Hispanic women. Local law enforcement began fining Hispanic women, who cohabitated with United Fruits black workers, literally fine for fucking the wrong colored meat sack. Uh, Those who could not pay often found themselves grinding corn for garrisons. Across Central America, there were some glimmers of unity when Hispanic and black workers united to carry out strikes in a few localities, but those quickly crushed. 1921, United Fruit completed its community house on Hospital Point, a social center and mess hall amid the first class housing complex and the recently expanded company hospital and medical uh, laboratory. This was part of a greater trend in U.S. business uh, following Henry Ford's design of corporate welfare, corporate welfare policies, man, uh, which aimed to cultivate worker loyalty and discourage labor organizing by treating workers so well that they would never want to strike. United Fruit's version of Fordism included improved housing and medical care for laborers, better stocked company commissaries, and an increase in the civic and leisure activities available in its tropic divisions. It would also require a positioning shift for the entire company. Rather than portray itself as a corporate expression of white colonial rule, as it had so often in its earlier years, United Fruit increasingly presented itself as a progressive uh, force that fostered stability and raised living standards throughout the Hispanic Caribbean. The new community house replaced the need for the much reviled Limon Limon Lodge, source of much employee protest over poor service and dismal food. As the company assumed total control of the employee room and board and absorbed the cost of staff, equipment, and furnishings, the cost of boarding each man went down from 30 bucks to 25, according to a railway manager. Total savings that came with the community house, he estimated, stood around 5,000 bucks a year for the company. So this was not a humanitarian venture. It was just some cost cutting. Superintendents and their families inhabited large multi-room homes with spacious, tidy landscape backyards. So nice for them. For this highest echelon of employees, the residents could be uh, more than one story and pretty, pretty big. The next class of managers, overseers, uh, lived in smaller one-family dwellings. And single white employees lived in bachelor's housing. Unmarried technicians or functionaries like Everett Brown uh, had been before he quit, they usually lived in dormitories with colleagues of similar statuses. Several men sleeping in the same small room. They were all surrounded by well-manicured lawns, parks, and walkways that encouraged face-to-face socialization between white people and other white people. 
They can spend their free time at various United Fruit-owned bars, billiard halls, dance floors, and libraries. On a typical workday, American employees took their meals at the local United Fruit Club and after dinner might read periodicals, chat, play cards, play pool. It was a nice improvement for the white workers. Meanwhile, nothing got better for the non-white laborers. Laborers, either indigenous to host countries or contracted from the West Indies, inhabited segregated areas on the margins of company towns. The company's non-white workers inhabited Spartan, unaccommodating barracks, often built literally across some railroad tracks from these uh, white neighborhoods. No manicured lawns surrounded them, no bars, no billiard halls, no dance floors, no libraries, nothing but a small company store where they could buy overpriced food and basic supplies. On a macro level at this time, companies like the United Fruit Company and thus United States were essentially running these Central American countries. The U.S. collected state revenues and supplied customs uh, commissioners, finance supervisors, revenue and distribution agents, and military personnel to enforce revenue collection and preserve the order necessary to permit business activity. In fundamental disputes between governments over these matters, the U.S. defined what was meant by democracy or freedom or financial responsibility and what had to be done to assure compliance. Central American nations existed for one uh, purpose and one purpose only in the eyes of the American government at this time, to provide a place where American business could greatly profit, uh, period. And in order for American business to profit greatly, these nations had to be safe for Americans. Whatever happened to the locals, whatever exploitation went down, that was of no real concern. Unless, you know, it was also bad for Americans. Uh, By the early 20th century, Central American countries had virtually surrendered control of major elements in their internal communications, public utilities, national debt, currency, state revenue, and other economic activities that generated national wealth to American corporations and or the American government. Influenced by local elites, excuse me, that worked with the American interests and profited at the expense of their fellow countrymen, these governments exercised only limited power over their political economies. But soon a new class of a Central American politician would gain power. The 1920s brought a surge of nationalist sentiment throughout Latin America. People who had grown up under exploitation uh, by American companies are now, uh, you know, running for political office. This eventually spurred the U.S. government to end most of its military occupations in the Hispanic Caribbean. More and more Hispanic workers resented their high-handed treatment by white American managers and also denounced the firm's apparent favoritism towards British West Indians. For their part, Central American leaders and middle-class nationalists increasingly viewed black immigration as inseparable from the problem of U.S. domination. West Indians came under increased attack as symbols of Yankee imperialism. So damn it, still not going after the real enemy. But also the governments of Costa Rica and Guatemala called for an end to the United Fruits control over commerce and infrastructure. So going after the real enemy uh, in some places. Within the company, Hispanic nationalism started to flourish. More and more often, Nicaraguans and Panamanians harbored fierce anti-American sentiments, and Nicaraguans in particular gained a reputation for talking back to U.S. bosses. United Fruit found it impossible to ignore the Hispanic nationalism that now threatened the order and autonomy of its enclaves. In response, United Fruit tried to blame some of their competitors, most of whom they had absorbed by now. One United uh, Fruit uh, company official wrote, It must be remembered that all past troubles have been caused by small, irresponsible companies and individuals and by unjust concessions, sometimes improperly obtained. In contrast, large corporations brought development without exploitation, they said. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then in 1924, United Fruit Company President Andrew Preston would die. By the time of his death, United Fruit Company alone imported 35 million bunches annually of bananas from Central America. 1924, the company had 20,000 stockholders valued at a $100 $100 million, roughly $1.8 billion today. It had 67,000 employees, owned 1,626,000 acres of land, and operated a fleet of 80 steamships. Directly served nine countries in the Western Hemisphere and played an important role in the commerce of 23 other countries. <laughs> Jesus. It established and maintained hotels for some of its employees, uh, churches, hospitals, schools, laundries, ice plants, bakeries, electrical light companies, waterworks, sewage systems, had 1,500 lines of railroads, uh, 700 miles of tramways. Sorry, not miles of railroads, not lines. Uh, 3,500 miles of telegraph and telephone lines. But then soon things would take a downturn. Uh, A few years later, by 1927, United Fruit was bleeding employees. That year, 39% of the men in the agricultural department, the majority of them with less than five years with the company, quit for a variety of reasons. Most of them medical and disciplinary. Uh, Not only that, like many other Central American governments, the government of Colombia had now turned against them. 
By 1927, Colombia's political system seemed to finally be leaning against the banana conglomerate. And now the National Assembly ordered an investigation into United Fruit's land acquisition policies. The Conservative Party's 30-year grip on power seemed to be loosening, with liberals making gains, especially in the countryside. Banana workers, who were still working without even the most basic human rights, felt emboldened. And now we arrive at the beginnings of the Banana Massacre. Throughout the rest of 1927 and 1928, the trend of discontent and resentment towards United Fruit continued. On the evening of October 5th, 1928, delegates for Colombia's banana workers in Magdalena gathered to discuss their grievances. Among their concerns were the long hours and low pay. One worker remembering, we worked from six in the morning until 11. And then, oh, sorry. First, I thought that was 11 at night. I'm like, my God, no, till 11 in the morning. And then from one in the afternoon until six. The contractor paid the salary and reserved up to 30% for himself. So 10 hours a day, and they were doing this seven days a week, 70 hour work weeks, and only getting paid 70% of whatever shitty wage they were supposed to get because the contractor is just fucking grifting off the top. Erasmo uh, Cornell spoke in favor of a strike. Others agreed. Then at around five in the morning, October 6th, the workers issued the United Fruit Company a list of nine demands. They demanded to be granted proper medical treatment, proper toilet facilities, right? That is, they wanted the same medical access and bathroom access as the white men they worked with. No more, no less. They insisted on being paid in cash rather than company-issued script, only redeemable, and United Fruit-owned stores. Man, not sure exactly when that bullshit was enacted, based on sources. But at some point, rather than pay their laborers actual money, these United Fruit motherfuckers pay them essentially just store credit. To be used at stores where they set the price. Stores often in company towns with no competition. Because of this, the workers were essentially slaves. Like, how the fuck do you move on to another job if you have literally no money, no matter how much you work? You're way out in the jungle. United Fruit housed them barely, then gave them enough store credit working 70 hours a week to buy clothes and food and other essentials from the company at stores you know they profited off of. Hard to negotiate for a raise when the company that owns you can fire you and now you have no place to live, no money to go get another job, you know, to, to find something else. This shit's outrageous. The workers also asked that they be considered they be considered true employees rather than subcontractors who were not even afforded the minimal protection of Colombia's very weak labor laws. Uh, this was the demands list in full. The nine uh, demands here. One, stop the practice of hiring through subcontractors. Two, mandatory collective insurance. Right, so when they get fucking hurt, they're not just, you know, out of... Uh, uh, like, like there's no kind of insurance for them. Uh, three, compensation for work accidents. Four, hygienic dormitories and six-day work weeks. Five, increase in daily pay for workers who earned less than 100 pesos per month. I was able to find historical Colombian peso to American dollar exchange rates for 1928. I didn't think I would. Thank you, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis Archives. I do love the internet sometimes. Uh, it was 97.7 to one. So basically, these... <laughs> These motherfuckers are being paid a dollar a month. A little bit less than a dollar, actually. The equivalent of less than $18 uh, a month today for someone working seven, 10 hour days a week and and not even a dollar in real money, a a fucking store, company store credit. And these other guys previously been fired for working, uh, wanting a buck 50 today. It's gotten so much worse. Uh, The workers also wanted six to be paid weekly, not monthly. Seven, abolition of of company stores. Uh, eight, abolition of payment through coupons rather than money. Nine, and finally, uh, improvement of hospital services. And United Fruit didn't want to hear any of this shit. They said that the employees had no right to make demands because they were temporary contractors and not real workers. Just temporary contractors working 70 hours a week until they died or couldn't take it and quit. After months of constant effort to seek an audience with United Fruit higher-ups, manager Thomas Bradshaw finally agrees to meet with USTM representatives on November 10th Uh, but then ignores them at the bargaining table and concedes to literally zero demands. These guys are some stone-hearted nanner tyrants. And so on November 12th, the strike begins. On the first day of the strike, the commander of the Colombian Armed Forces appoints General Carlos Cortez Vargas as the military chief at Santa Marta and the the Banana Zone. By the second day, Cortez Vargas was in Cienega with a battalion. There were no soldiers from Magdalena involved because General Cortez Vargas did not believe they would be able to take effective actions as they might be related to the plantation workers they might need to kill. One worker later recalled that when soldiers asked a group of striking workers who was in charge, they defiantly responded that they were all in charge. Man, hail Nimrod to these brave motherfuckers. 
The conflict is now making headlines in the U.S. A New York Times article published in December of 1928 lays out the company position on the strike. A banana company spokesman attributed the strike not to a genuine need to improve conditions for exploited workers, but to a, quote, subversive movement carried out by men who weren't even representatives of any established body of laborers. In fact, the article quoted the company as saying, no complaints have been received by our employees. <laughs> uh, United Fruit reported that in response to the strike, uh, the Colombian government had suspended the rights of, <clears throat> excuse me, free assembly and free speech. We are convinced, a spokesperson said, that only this prompt action by the government prevents great loss of life. So crazy how some Americans are all too happy to take away the freedoms from other nations' people that we pride ourselves on being champions of at home. Uh, martial laws declared in Cienega, Colombia, just outside of Santa Marta, December 5th. The clampdown is celebrated by the U.S. Ambassador to Colombia, Jefferson Caffrey, uh, who sent a telegram to U.S. Secretary of State, Frank Kellogg, that said, I've been following Santa Marta fruit strike through United Fruit Company representative here. Also through Minister of Foreign Affairs, who on Saturday told me government would send additional troops and would arrest all strike leaders and transport them to prison in Cartagena. That government would give adequate protection to American interests involved. Yeah, fuck those guys who want basic worker rights. Uh, the, ten the tensions mount the next day, December 6th, telegram from Santa Marta consulate to the U.S. Secretary of State uh, reads, feeling against the government by the pro proletariat, which is shared by some of the soldiers is high and is doubtful if we can depend on the Colombian government for protection. May I respectfully suggest that my request for the presence within calling distance of an American warship be granted, and that it stand off subject to my call. It is admitted that the character of the strike has changed, and the disturbance is a manifestation with a subversive tendency. Uh, but that day was actually supposed to be a peaceful day. It was a Sunday, and in Cienega, banana workers and their families uh, gathered mid-morning in the big town square. There was no hint of violence in the air. The city hall stood at one end of the square, a big church at the other, which is where a large portion of the workers were leaving from. They'd attended mass. When they got out, soldiers informed them to gather and wait for the regional governor to give them a speech. Uh, they weren't even gathered together as part of some subversive plan to riot. They were told by soldiers to gather in the square. Striker Sixto Espino Nunez would later convey the strikers' hopes for reconciliation that day, saying, the people firmly believed that the army would not fire and the governor would arrive, but that would not happen. Uh, what they didn't know was that General Cortez Vargas had given his commanders these orders. Prepare your mind to face these crowds of rebels and kill before foreign troops tread upon our soil. What the fuck? Four machine gun positions are surrounding the square now. Put on rooftops, one at each corner. As the crowd gathered, General Cortez Vargas announced to the banana workers and their families that a new decree, quote, declared the strikers to be a bunch of hoodlums and authorized the army to shoot to kill. That's his opening line. Delivered to exploited banana baron laborers, many of whom had just left church, right? They were, they were told to gather in the square and they're there with their wives and kids. Then the soldiers issued an order that the air needed to be clear in five minutes. But not everyone in the crowd heard these orders. There was confusion. I mean, they had just been told by soldiers to gather there, to stay there. Now they're being told to leave. Uh, they'd also just been threatened. Many are milling about. They're afraid to, to do anything else. There are thousands of people in the square. Less than five minutes later, not even honoring their unjust decree, the troops just open fire. But luckily, Fighting Man is there to save the day. Fight, 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 fight. Watch out for my melee sword. This is my defense shield. United fruit hired guns. Fight, 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 fight. Brought and paid for Colombian soldiers. Fight, 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 fight. Evil banana baron. Naughty pants guys, fight, fight, fight. Shove bananas in their buttholes until their heads explode. Fight, fight, fight. Pretty sure that's not even possible, but they did it anyway. Fight, fight, nana, fight. Stop their fucking heads explode. I wish. Sorry, I couldn't decide on a great song for the fight guy this time. I don't, know, I don't know if I like that one. Now, sadly, fighting man did not show up and just fucking slaughter the enemy. Uh, no one shoved bananas up the banana baron's butts. No one exploded their heads. And now it's a very one-sided massacre. Uh, later, U.S. Ambassador to Columbia, Caffrey, reported the events to his superiors in Washington, reported the events. The tone and language of the memo, pretty chilling. I have the honor to report that the Bogota representative of the United Fruit Company told me yesterday that the total number of strikers killed by the Colombian military exceeded 1,000. Wow. Uh, the people of the Banana Zone insisted that the military killed hundreds of strikers that night, but when daylight broke, according to the official memory, just nine bodies lay in the plaza. Uh, Josefa Maria, who worked from Cienega, 
to support the strike noted that the military had deliberately left those corpses as a symbol, saying they had only left nine dead bodies equal to the nine demands the workers made. Far more people than nine would die. After the massacre, many workers fled, seeking refuge in the mountains, but others stayed, sought to avenge the killing of their companions. Uh, the workers destroyed several of the United Fruit Company's buildings, including the engineers' quarters in Sevilla. Among the survivors was Luis Vicente uh, Gomez, later a famous local figure who survived by hiding under a bridge for three days. Every year after the massacre going forward for decades, he would deliver a memorial service on the radio. Uh, meanwhile, the Colombian military and United Fruit Company did not let up in their persecution of workers. A telegram to the Secretary of State on December 7th read, Situation outside Santa Marta City unquestionably very serious. Outside zone is in revolt. Military who have orders not to spare ammunition have already killed and wounded about 50 strikers. So, uh, much less. Uh, government now talks of general offensive against strikers as soon as all troop ships now on the way arrive early next week. We just declared war on these strikers. Follow up to the U.S. Department of State would add the uh, legation at Bogota reports that categorical orders have been given to authorities at Santa Marta to protect all American interests. The department does not repeat not desire to send a warship to Santa Marta. Keep the department informed of all developments by telegraph. Uh, the next day's telegram would report that uh, American citizens have been evacuated from the area. It added guerrilla warfare now continuing in the zone, but military forces are actively engaged in clearing the district of the communists. And now they're painting the strikers as communists. The American government was now working hard to portray the uh, protesting workers as some kind of Bolsheviks, right? This uh, riled up by, uh, you know, some foreign agitators. You know, that military intervention might be necessary. It was uh, uh, the Russian Revolution all over again. No, it wasn't. Meanwhile, the country's Liberal Party had heard about the massacre and was using it as a rallying point. They pointed out how the government was helping United Fruit in killing their own people. Conservative newspapers tried to defend the government's actions. The words did nothing to quench the liberal tide now sweeping through Colombia. Uh, in reality, we'll never know how many workers or their family members were killed in the banana massacre. Uh, official estimates put the death toll anywhere between 47, most people don't think it was that low at all, to around 2,000 people. According to Congressman Jorge Alicia Gatan, the bodies of all but nine of the strikers were thrown out into the sea. Other sources claim the bodies were buried in mass graves, but no agreed upon official story. Just a bunch of variations based, biased, excuse me, in numerous ways, depending on the source they come from. The American press biased towards United Fruits, towards a lower number of fatalities. Uh, the, some of the Colombian press also biased towards United Fruit, the more conservative uh, papers, and then some biased against them, the more liberal papers. The true story of the Banana Massacre, uh, the exact details, you know, lost to history. We do know uh, that the Banana Massacre and subsequent support for workers did lead to the 1930 election of liberal president Olea Herrera. Uh, liberals then celebrated their victory at the polls with massacres, assassinations, looting, and the destruction of property and the burning of many buildings, including a lot of churches. This further polarized the country, as you might imagine. And in 1946, conservatives would return to power, setting off another wave of violence. 1948, the assassination of liberal presidential hopeful Jorge Alicia Gatan ignites huge riots in Bogota, kicking off a civil war that'll last until 1957 called La Violencia in Colombia. An estimated 200,000 people killed during this period, including 112,000 between 1948 and 1950 alone. Large parts of Colombia's cities destroyed. The partisan violence created a rift between liberals and conservatives, which ultimately triggered a breakdown of existing institutional structures and a partial collapse of the state. This would uh, only be resolved in 1947 with the establishment of the uh, Con Socio National National Front between the two traditional parties, which agreed to alternate between liberal and conservative presidencies for a period of 16 years and to evenly distribute all government positions between the two parties as a way of limiting partisan, partisan violence. Although not directly responsible, United Fruits Colombian meddling contributed towards all the violence and polarization. So what happened to United Fruit? We'll back up a little bit. In 1929, year after the massacre, little tiny, barely visible minor Keith completed the line connecting Guatemala and El Salvador, uh, those railroads, which meant the unification of a system of 800 miles of track valued at 800 or $80 million. And then he died on June 14th. He was buried in a coffin the size of a box of matches. Exactly that size. He was buried in a box of matches, all three and a half inches tall, four ounces of him. When he died, United Fruit Company's largest competition was uh, Cuyamel Fruit Company. Then United Fruit bought them out. The new, bigger United Fruit kept growing. By the end of 1940, the company owned 61 ships, chartered 11 more. A British affiliate owned an additional 23 ships. At the start of World War II, this fleet was taken over by the American and British governments, but war didn't stop the company from expanding. 
1944, United Fruit invests in some marketing that gives them the most brand recognition they'd ever had. They hired cartoonist Dick Brown, the creator of Hagar the Horrible, and yes, his name was Dick Brown. So great uh, to create a cartoon based on the Latin American singer and movie star Carmen Miranda. The cartoon was called Miss Chiquita Banana. The character of Miss Chiquita Banana debuted in the Technicolor movie advertisement Miss Chiquita Banana's Beauty Treatment, where she sang to uh, revive an exhausted housewife. By 1946, United Fruit Company had 83,000 employees, owned over 116,000 acres for the cultivation of bananas, almost 100,000 more acres for sugarcane, and almost 50,000 acres for cocoa. 1953, Guatemalan President uh, Jacobo Arbenz declared that uh, just under 210,000 acres of uncultivated lands of United Fruit should be uh, distributed to landless present peasants. The Guatemalan, uh, Guatemalan government promised the company in... Uh, I didn't, I didn't, my, there's so many fucking words. I didn't realize how hard they would be to say this goddamn script. Indemnification. Okay. Words you always read, but never fucking say. The company, uh, an indemnification of $627,572 in governmental bonds based on the company's declared tax value of the land. United Fruit decides to fight this in 1954, launched a campaign that portrayed Arbenz as a dangerous communist. Working together with an advertisement company, they distributed alarmist propaganda among the press and Congress in which they portrayed Guatemala as a foothold of the Soviet Union in the Western Hemisphere. The campaign was very successful. The CIA ended up sponsored a military coup against Arbenz, maybe not Arbenz, Arbenz, in which the rebels used United Fruit uh, boats to transport troops and ammunition. The colonel who led the coup, Carlos Castillo, uh, repealed Arbenz labor and agrarian reforms and harshly repressed the opposition. CIA involvement in Central America, a story for another day. Uh, Eli M. Black then bought 733,000 shares of United Fruit in 1968 and became the company's largest shareholder. June of 1970, Black merged United Fruit with his own public company, AMK, to create the United Brands Company. After his death in 1974, Cincinnati-based American Financial Group bought into United Brands. August of 1984, billionaire Carl Lidner took control of the company and renamed it Chiquita Brands International. Headquarters moved to Cincinnati in 1985. Chiquita Brands International made $3.1 billion in revenue in 2022, uh, shortly before being bought out by Bear Evil Incorporated. Bear, the only corporation in the world with the balls to admit they are full-on evil. Bear, admittedly, only in it for the money. They don't care about their employees. They don't care about you South America, Central America, North America, or even sexy ass nanners. Bear Evil Incorporated. Go fuck yourself. Uh, I wonder how much Chiquita would have made in 2022 if they hadn't exploited the fuck out of Central and South America and the Caribbean uh, decades earlier. Uh, and that is it for today's timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. The Banana Massacre, who knew? The legacy of my favorite breakfast fruit, so dark. Uh, the Space Lizards voted this topic in. They knew, I did not. Man, this, and this kind of shit still goes on today. Uh, recently, I was talking to somebody at the gym about how much of the shit that we have you know, right now has so much darkness behind it. Uh, we were actually talking about the hypocrisy of someone who uh, say, you know, really looks down on you for, I don't know, being the asshole who uses a plastic straw. But then that person is uh, you know looking down on you while wearing clothes made in some South Pacific sweatshop. Or, or maybe they're posting you know, about what a piece of shit someone is for not supporting some social justice cause using a phone made in a communist Chinese factory where the conditions are so fucking dire and hopeless that the company installed nets around the building to cut back on the amount of suicides because workers would rather literally throw themselves off the fucking roof than keep making the phones. Or the hypocrisy of someone patting themselves on the back for driving an electric car instead of some gas guzzler, a uh, car that runs on a battery built out of components, some of which are mined by exploited children, right? These are not random references. If you live in America or you live in some other developed nation, you, just like me, have blood in your hands. Thanks to corporations, no better in many ways than the United Fruit Company was back in the early 20th century, or at least not that much better. How do we break out of that cycle? I don't know. Not going to be easy. No one can just snap their fingers and remake the world into a place more humane and equitable for everybody. Best we can do right now is make the most informed choices we can when we can. 
But even that's not easy, right? I try to make good choices, but also I can't make my life work without a cell phone. I can't make my you know uh, life work without a computer. My entire business is built on content consumed on cell phones and computers. And both cell phones and computers use components mined in parts of the world where exploitation is still the norm. And, you know, in other similar electronics, you know, it's like you know, all these like uh, activists and Hollywood and stuff. And I, and I get it like good for them for raising attention to things, but it's also their content is being consumed on screens made of shit mined by people being exploited. Like their whole fucking career is dependent on their shit being seen via electronic devices that are not made ethically. Ah, circling back to, uh, to fruit from far away that were, uh, you know, able to not much pay, uh, not <laughs> they were able to not pay much to buy here in the States, uh, fruit pick with cheap foreign labor. How do we avoid supporting that? Right. Not everybody has a farmer's market near them. Not everybody can afford to buy local. Sadly, it's not realistic for most of us to only make ethical purchases. So what do we do? Well, we can try and support politicians who, uh, stand up to exploitive corporations. Whenever we can, we support companies that support workers, something's better than nothing. But you know, those politicians, those companies, it's surprisingly hard to figure out where people stand and where the company stands. Here's an example. I probably spent too much time on this, but most of the t-shirts we sell in our store at badmagicmerch.com, uh, next level apparel t-shirts, many other podcasts, band t-shirts, comic t you know, whatever, just a lot of t-shirts in general, same brand or, or an equivalent brand made in the same area or in a very similar area by a similar workforce if not the same workforce. Next Level Tees, they are made somewhere we just spent time exploring in Nicaragua. The company on their website, they pride themselves on social responsibility. Per their website, it says, our commitment to operational excellence. At the forefront of our social responsibility and social compliance is our commitment to our workers to implement the highest ethical standards of conduct and best quality practices in the USA and internationally. We are relentless about partnering with suppliers who uphold the same high ethical standard, prioritize workers' rights by ensuring working conditions in factories worldwide, administer and implement our workplace code of conduct through our entire global supply chain. More specifically, NLA is committed to upholding our workplace code of conduct and FLA's principles of fair labor and responsible sourcing throughout our entire global supply chain. We have made it our mission at Next Level Apparel to collaborate with the FLA and fellow affiliates to improve workers' lives worldwide. We're also partners with Better Work on a factory, national and international level, to improve working conditions and respect labor rights for workers while boosting the competitiveness of apparel. And that all sounds great. But did you notice how they didn't share any specific details? Like how much do they pay their Nicaraguan workers? Can't find that on the website. I can't find that anywhere. The, The monthly minimum wage for a Nicaraguan factory worker, just kind of nationwide, is 192 uh, US dollars, 192 and 25 cents, under $200 a month, a month. The average monthly wage for any job in Nicaragua is 305 US dollars. Here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, the McDonald's, about a mile from where I'm sitting right now and recording, is currently paying, well, at least last I checked, 16 bucks an hour for like an opening position because they can't get anybody to work for less. And that's a wage of over $2,500 a month. Some high school kid working here in Idaho, a state not known for supporting workers, uh, working at McDonald's, a company not known for paying high wages, is making over 12 times the average factory worker what they're making in Nicaragua. If Next Level really, truly cared about workers' rights, would they even have a factory in a country where people make such little money? Or does $192.25 a month do just as much for someone's life in Nicaragua as $2,500 a month does here? I don't think so. Doing some research and reading articles about U.S. citizens considering living in Nicaragua, basic groceries cost on the low end about $25 per person per week. Over half of that, uh, $192 a month, gone to food. Rent in a very small place with no AC and no hot water, the bottom of the barrel is at least $250 a month, according to these articles. So if two people are working at the average factory down there, they can rent the shittiest of apartments, not quite have enough money for food, and then no money for anything else. Is Next Level paying a lot more than $192 and, you know, 50 cents a month or 25 cents a month? I hope so. Are they paying double the average factory worker wage there? I doubt it. Even double the wage though. Double the wage and and a worker still would not make enough to support themselves living alone in a studio apartment. So should we not use them? Well, if not them, who? 
Our distributor doesn't work with any brands that are made just in the USA, uh, as far as I can tell. And even if they did, how much are their factory workers being paid? And how does that compare to people in other countries, right? Like the wage uh, that they're being paid, how does that compare to living here in the US? I mean, do you see how fucking complicated all this is? If you were an American in 1929 and you found out about this story, would you stop eating bananas? What about now? Are you no longer going to buy a Chiquita banana? Not ever? Are other choices that much better? I have a lot of respect for people who can avoid a lot of these choices. And there are those people out there. But if we all behave like they did, would our economy literally completely fucking collapse and make life so much worse for everyone? Yes. Yes, it would. I wish I had easier answers regarding all of this. This topic reminds me of the Bear AG, the most evil company in the world suck, right? Bear has a terrible legacy. A lot of that terrible legacy also took place in Central and South America. But sadly, as we learned in that episode, so do so many other fucking companies. The brutal truth of it all is that if you're living in a developed nation, if you're enjoying a really good standard of living, you are doing that at least partially at the expense of other people in the world. Your fresh fruit is affordable at someone else's expense. Same for your clothes, your phone, your car, on and on and on. So should we feel guilty all the time about all this? No, that's not why I'm pointing out. We should just be aware of it though. And we should each do the best we can depending on the situation that we are in to understand what we're buying and try to support the most ethical companies we can. When we can, if we can. If you're barely paying your bills, raising a kid as a single parent, don't add fucking more stress to your plate. But maybe someday your situation will change. And then you can do something to help. And something's better than nothing. You could tip a bit more, buy fair trade coffee, buy farmer's market fucking produce. You get it. I know on this podcast, I made dozens of announcements about donations we've made, you know, only possible because of subscribers. But you know how much money I donated over the course of my adult life prior to my career changing thanks to this show? Uh, Almost fucking nothing. And you know what? I'm sure I'm still going to eat plenty of Chiquita bananas. I travel a lot at airports and gas stations. Don't offer a lot of choices. I need my fruit, you motherfuckers. And sometimes maybe I get horny. So horny. Uh, no, <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know, uh, I want to try and get like local fruit, like when I can, when given the choice between companies, at least supposedly trying to support, you know, shit like next level claims and some other company that I know is doing a terrible job. I'm going to make the responsible choice and pick the responsible company. And that's better than just giving up and not doing anything. Episodes like today's remind me that, you know, choices do matter. They remind me, uh, that, you know, our real human lives, that there are real, excuse me, human lives behind the shit that we buy. None of that shit shows up in the store magically. It comes from somewhere. Sometimes the story behind it, way more tragic than I like to think about. Man, crazy history. Uh, I'm guessing that most people, you know, when they think of Central America, they think of, uh, you know, Maya ruins, delicious food, beautiful beaches, vacation resorts. But behind the history of the modernization that now makes comfortable travel to these destinations possible, man, some dark shit. A lot of Latin American authors have written about U.S. imperialism and United Fruit. We looked at the Colombian author Gabriel Garcia Marquez at the beginning of the episode. Well, famed Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, Neruda also wrote about United Fruit, saying the fruit company incorporated reserved for itself the most succulent piece, the central coast of my own land, the delicate waste of America. It rechristened its territories, banana republics, and over the sleeping dead, over the restless heroes who brought about the greatness, the liberty, and the flags that established the comic opera, it abolished free will, gave out imperial crowns, encouraged envy, attracted the dictatorship of flies. Flies sticky with submissive blood and marmalade, drunken flies that buzz over the tombs of the people, circus flies, wise flies expert at tyranny. Damn. Whew. Those words uh, hit hard after learning what we just went over this week. Let's head to today's takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the banana massacre occurred December 6, 1928, when soldiers opened machine gun fire on a maybe striking, maybe not striking crowd. Uh, not currently uh, doing anything uh, dangerous, that's for sure, crowd in the town square of Cienega in Colombia. The exact number of workers killed has been lost to history, but the callousness of United Fruit, who blamed outside agitators and called to the military, has, has not been. And they were striking. They were just not uh, currently seeming to be protesting. Number two, United Fru Fruit Company has a long and tumultuous history informed by both brazen corporate policy, gobbling up as much land and controlling as much of the supply chain as possible, and by racist and paternalistic ideologies. Number three, United Fruit constantly played populations off each other to maintain control over its employees, which pitted Hispanic workers against Black West Indian workers. All of them, in reality, were probably looking for the same thing, just enough money to support themselves and their families and improve the quality of their lives. 
Number four, United Fruit for a time paid its workers not in actual cash, but in store credit. How would you like to work for Amazon and only be paid in Amazon gift cards? Or maybe more comparable to what United Fruit did, work for Target or Walmart and then only be able to shop at Target or Walmart. What a fucking absurd policy. Number five, new info. In 2007, some Colombian citizens sued Chiquita Brands International, accusing the company of making payments to a paramilitary group responsible for hundreds of civilian killings. The lawsuit accused Chiquita of complicity in hundreds of deaths because of its financial support of the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, also known by its Spanish initials, AUC. The plaintiffs concluded or included relatives of 387 people thought to have been killed by the group. The group was designated a terrorist group by the U.S. in 2001. Chiquita had already acknowledged that a former subsidiary, uh, Banadex, uh, had paid $1.7 million to the AUC from 1997 to 2004. The company also admitted that the payments were illegal. It pled guilty earlier in 2007 to violating counterterrorism laws and agreed to pay a $25 million fine. Chiquita insisted that it had no choice but to pay protection money to groups like the AUC that had threatened to turn death squads loose on its banana plantations and employees. But the New York lawyer who filed the lawsuit on behalf of the families, Jonathan Ryder, said Chiquita's support of the AUC went beyond mere protection payments and included the shipment of thousands of rifles. In the 2015 documentary Banana Land, Colombian plantain workers spoke up about how they feel terrorized by multinational companies like Chiquita and their work with paramilitaries. They even said that people who speak up about the way they feel are at risk of being targeted by the AUC, targeted as in murdered. As for the class action lawsuit, it's still unsettled. In 2016, Florida federal judge Kenneth Mara rejected uh, Chiquita's argument that the case should be heard in Colombia rather than the U.S., allowing the case to advance. In August of 2022, however, U.S. District Judge Kenneth E. Mara found Chiquita Brand International's payments approved in the United States were not made specifically to fund terror attacks on innocent civilians. Although Chiquita executives allegedly knew or should have known that the money paid to the AUC would incidentally fuel such attacks. Today, a total of 19 Chiquita lawsuits are reportedly still pending. The plaintiffs include approximately 7,500 Colombian nationals who allege their family members were victims of extrajudicial killings and human rights and human right violations by the AUC. Seems as if a bunch of exploitive nanofuckery still going on in at least some areas where United Fruit and its predecessors and successors have long made life worse for Central and South American people. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The 1928 Banana Massacre has been sucked. Had no idea. So much blood and terrible inhumane treatment was associated with the harmless banana we nearly all see somewhere nearly every day. Uh, Thank you to Bad Magic Productions, to the team here for your help in making time suck. Thanks to the Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Thanks to the Suck Ranger, Tyler C., for producing and directing today. Thanks also to Bitelixer for upkeep on the Time Suck app, the Art Warlock, Logan Keith, for creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com and helping run socials with the Suck Ranger and a team led by social media strategist Ryan Handelsman. Uh, thanks to producer Sophie Evans for some top-notch research on this one. It's kicking it off. Not an easy topic to put together in any kind of narrative and, you know, have it be interesting <laughs> to the average person. Also, thanks to the uh, all seen Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page, the Mod Squad, making sure Discord keeps running smooth, and everyone over at the Time Suck subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. Thanks to you for taking a chance on a random subject like this one. I hope my mush mouth didn't fuck it up for you. This is a challenging Top, top shelf Scrabble words today. Uh, next week on Time Suck, we return to true crime, the Hillside Stranglers. The Hillside Strangler Singular was the name of a suspected serial killer targeting young women and girls in and around Los Angeles, California in the fall of 1977 and in early 1978. Young women in the area, understandably terrified they would be the next victim. The fact that it was suspe- suspected by many uh, that the killer was posing as a police officer added to their fear. Victims were found in October, November, and December of 1977. Young women and girls usually found naked with distinct marks that indicated they died of strangulation and there was evidence of rape. Despite the similarities in the murders, the victims were different. Some were sex workers, others were college students, waitresses. One was a teen runaway. Youngest victims were just 15, 14, and 12. After breaking the murders in January of 1978, the Hillside Strangler killed another victim in February. This time, the victim was found in the trunk of her car, which had been pushed off a cliff. The police had few leads and witness statements. They now suspect that more than one person was involved, but they just couldn't find him. In January of 1979, one of the Hillside Stranglers was finally arrested after two college students were strangled in Bellingham, Washington. The Strangler was Kenneth Bianchi, and he revealed that his cousin, Angelo Bono, was the second killer. 
Bianchi and Bono were cousins who shared violent sexual urges and a desire to kill. Kenneth would reveal the gruesome details of how each victim was killed and the cold and calculating thought process behind the murders. How did Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Bono become the Hillside Stranglers? How did they grow up? What kind of lifestyles did they live that led to them becoming killers? Who were the victims? How were these killer cousins finally caught? All that and more next week on Time Suck. Right now, let's get to today's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. First up, some extra info about Mount St. Helens from someone who knows a lot more about this shit than I do. Uh, Scientific sucker Brian Fuller writes, Dear Lizard King and the rest of the Time Suck crew, congrats on the Mount St. Helens suck. As a professional geophysicist, I give you an A on geologic accuracy and doing a great job on describing a complex scientific subject without diving too far into the weeds and distracting from a great story. Well, you know what? Uh, That thanks will be passed along to Sophie Evans because she set me up to uh, be successful by doing a fucking killer job structuring the information. I just added a bit here and there. St. Helens story has uh, another connection for me because I grew up south of Chehalis, Chehalis, uh, Washington in the 1970s and saw a beautiful and up-close view of St. Helens every day uh, when it wasn't covered by clouds. My brother-in-law, who I didn't know at the time, was also a seismology grad student at UW and had been on the mountain the morning of the eruption checking on the size, seismometers. A uh, close one, bro. Closely related to the subject, I wanted to mention another incredible volcanic story that shapes today's topography and scenery of all of eastern Washington, large parts of Idaho, including Coeur d'Alene, and large parts of eastern Oregon. About 15 million years ago, cracks many miles long formed in the Earth's surface and spilled out sheets of hot lava that traveled hundreds of miles and covered thousands of square miles. The wave of hot lava traveled up to 50 miles per hour and would have been 50 foot thick in places. Fucking amazing to see if humans had existed there at that time. Uh, this story was repeated many times over several million years and deposited accumulate basalt or basalt, the rock that is left after lava cools and solidifies thousands of feet thick in many places. You can see the layers of lava particularly well by driving in the Columbia River Gorge on I-84. This story was followed later by an equally amazing geo story in which the continental glaciers melted at the end of the last ice age about 12,000 years ago. Torrents of water gouged the top of the basalt and ripped the Columbia River Gorge into existence with water flow over 700 feet higher than the current Columbia River surface. The river is currently 300 feet deep, so damn, that would have been cool to see, and humans did live in the area at that time. Love you guys, and scratchable jangles on the tummy for me. Spaces of Brian. Uh, Brian, thanks for sharing uh, awesome info. Man, sheets of lava coming out of cracks in the ground, miles long. Can you imagine seeing that today? 50 miles per hour doesn't sound that fast uh, until you're running. You know the average human only runs eight miles an hour? (laughs) <laughs> 50 miles an hour equals a four minute mile. I have never ran that fast at my best many years ago. I was able to run just under a six minute mile for three miles. And it felt like I was fucking hauling ass. We had these little, uh, Unagi scooters. They're kind of like a lime scooter at the house. They top out at 16 miles an hour. <laughs> and it feels like you're really zipping along. And it's funny for me to think about scooting away from a massive lava field. Just barely moving faster than the lava, praying that the lava slows down before my battery gives out. Yeah, all that stuff would have been so crazy to see. Uh, Next up, South Dakota sucker, Holly Davidson. She got got. Holly writes, Dan, you motherfucker. This is the second time I've been Cummins Law, but the first time writing about it. I'm partially to blame, but dude, it's about 50-50 in the blame game. I should know better. When will I learn? I was listening to the Mount St. Helens suck on my way to work this morning, and you kept up about the volcano eruption boner spraying magna cum everywhere. And then, and this is what I should have known better, you said you were done talking about said eruption boner. I literally thought to myself, oh shit, someone's going to fall for that. Fast forward to my lunch break. In my car, enjoying an amazing sunny 65 degrees South Dakota spring day, windows down, birds chirping, living life. I roll up to Dairy Queen. Sounds amazing. And before I can even say anything, you fucking say, maybe right now a volcano has a massive bulge growing. You know what's inside that bulge? That's right. Something I said I wasn't going to talk about again, but sometimes I lie. A massive eruption boner is about to grow. And that's when I snapped my attention from the menu and had the wherewithal to turn down the volume. And then I heard, uh, order whenever you're ready. Just another reminder that every day we stray further from God's light. Such a funny sentence. Anyways, wanted to share that. I'm glad I was able to drag my husband to see you in Minneapolis for the taping of your special. Can't wait to see it so I can tell people there. That annoying laugh, that's me. I'm surprised he came with me because I introduced him to the pod with Albert Fish. He must love me very much. Thanks to Bad Magic, folks, for all you do to keep us sane-ish. 
Uh, well, thank you, Holly, for listening so we can keep this weird train on the tracks. And thanks for going to that taping and still waiting for the final nitpicky edits to be completed. I'm hoping to get an email any moment, like it's done. And then we can figure out where it's going to live. I uh, can't wait to get it out there. Now, a quick note from an encouraging sucker, Nicholas Tanetti, who writes, my friend John got me to the cult of the curious and I have been sucked 50 plus times now. He wants to go to the wet, hot, bad magic summer camp, but I'm unable to go and he doesn't want to go alone. I have a simple request. Please tell John to drink some fucking Whipple and buy his damn ticket. Thank you, Nick. Well, thank, thank you, Nick. Uh, yeah, John, ton of people are coming alone. Uh, same thing happened last year and we got so much feedback later about how so many of them had the best time, met new friends they stayed in touch with. Uh, you could start, if you wanted to kind of test the water before you think of, you know, make up your mind about a ticket, uh, you could make some friends in advance, ask some questions uh, by joining the camp's Facebook group. You just go for, uh, or just look for Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp 2023. Within Facebook, it comes right up. Uh, you can introduce yourself to the crew there and then, yeah, see if it feels right to go solo or not. And since I haven't mentioned it in a while here, uh, camp is September 21st through the 24th. Thanks to everyone who's bought tickets, people still buying them and it's going to be a blast. Uh, now for an update from nearly divorced super sucker Mont Van Buskirk, who traumatized his children with uh, details from Skidmark sex life. <laughs> uh, Mont writes, hello, Dan and crew. I'm writing this uh, as a time suck update while I'm standing in a hot commercial building in St. George, Utah. I'm a commercial carpenter. And if you don't already know, it gets hot here, even in April. I was calling to tell you my first and hopefully last Cummins Law debacle. A little setup. I'm 35 years old and a full-time college student. And about 32 hours uh, per week, blue collar worker. My wife is a full-time student and a full-time employee of a drug rehabilitation center. She does all her school online, so she has time to work full-time. Needless to say, we are trying everything we can to make life better for our sons. Man, hail Nimrod. You guys are, that's fucking inspiring. With this in mind, recently we needed to get a new vehicle and neither of us had, uh, had ever had much. My old pickup being the nicest. We found we could make it work to get her a brand new car though. Big deal in our world. Yes, congrats. Anyway, Bluetooth and cars was foreign to us. And we both thought it was super cool to connect our phones for music and calls. This is the issue. I was listening to the Jeff Lundgren suck, Jeffrey Lundgren suck in my pickup in front of my home about to leave. It's physically plugged into my truck stereo. Then my wife shows up and has to grab something from inside the house. She leaves my seven and nine year old in the car and then runs inside. At that moment, my truck stops playing the episode as you start talking about Jeff's love of poop play. As I sit there trying to figure out what's going on, I see my son laughing and <laughs> my son's laughing and waving at me. I wave back. I continue trying to figure out what's going on. My wife runs out of the house, heads to her car, opens the door and stands there disgusted and then just stares at me. It was at that moment I realized my phone had connected to the Bluetooth in my wife's car and was blasting the podcast from my voice. <laughs> Probably the fifth time in 10 years, my wife has lost her cool with me and now I've scarred my children. Needless to say, I had to do a lot of explaining. And ignorance of technology is not great in today's world. So yeah, I'm sure I will never hear the end of this. Anyway, figured someone could laugh at my stupidity. Thanks for making my days better and keep it up, Mont V. Mont, my God! Of all the stuff I've talked about that your kids could have hurt. I mean, at least probably better than a lot of the brutal true crime depictions. I hope that the, uh, I hope the exposure to scat play disgusted them. And then they never want to, uh, you know, be shit on in the bedroom or shit on others. And good on you and your wife for working your asses off again, going to school to improve your lives, better provide for your children. I mean, working that much and going to school that much. How honorable, how inspirational. Again, I love it. Uh, thank you for the messages, everybody who, who keeps sending them in. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Please do not exploit a massive geographical area for over a century so you can make more money on fruit this week. Just put a banana in your mouth, put this podcast in your ears, and keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. This episode left me wondering whether tragic stories are associated with other fruit, maybe vegetables. I hope there's some really super dark, fucked up shit in the history of cherry tomatoes. I would love a good moral excuse to never have to eat those nasty little fake vegetable grapes ever again.